Hello, everybody. This is a Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this special presentation on a Thursday night. Uh, if you have been following my channel and the Church of the Eternally Secure program, you know that we normally uh, have a live program every Sunday and every Wednesday. Uh, this is Thursday. So what's the special occasion? Well, we have uh, an opportunity to talk to Brother Jack Smack 77 tonight. And uh, the way this uh, whole thing came about was uh, uh, I, I've done some uh, discussions like this with uh, him in the past. Uh, and he made a comment recently on a video. He, he'd like to join a, another one of these live programs. So I spoke to him on the phone and I said, well, what is it you'd like to discuss? And he said, uh, how about eternal torment? So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And uh, before we get into it, I, I have a lot of verses we're going to go over tonight. Before we get into it, uh, I'm going to ask uh, each of uh, Renee and uh, Jack Smack just to say hi. Introduce yourself. J Brother Jack Smack, why don't you just say hi? If anybody who doesn't know you, uh, 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 just tell them, um, take a moment, and tell them what you're doing on your channel. Hi, my name is uh, Jack Smack Seven Seven on YouTube. I have a couple other channels, but they're kind of uh, you know obscure. Most people don't even know where they are because I haven't put videos up on those. But my main channel and focus is to preach the gospel um, and basically to correct all the errors that are out there. You know, on, on the internet, there's a lot of false gospels being preached, and unfortunately, it's it's way more than there is you know the correct gospel. It's like I probably say ninety percent bad, ten percent good. And my goal is just, like I said, to correct gospel preached, the clear gospel of grace, and to expunge all this falsehood. Amen. And I can tell you that I, um, Brother Jack Smack has uh, been a friend to me on YouTube longer than anybody else I can think of for um, probably about 10 years now. And uh, uh, nobody defends the true gospel more so than Brother Jack Smack and Sister Renee. So I'm, I'm in great company here tonight. Sister Renee, uh, what are, what's your opening thoughts? Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for coming on an unscheduled night and hanging out with us. Um, yep, Jack Smack puts the smack down on false gospels, even little subtle changes they make to it. Any kind of human merit, he knocks it right out of the park. So uh, we all are on the same foundation. I just wanted to remind everybody this is not us trying to convert anybody to think in any way but just to study what scripture alone says keep our minds open and uh i told brother luke when i began my journey i was going to start attacking and checking out every tradition i'd been taught and i wanted to understand scripture through scripture alone and god teaching me so this is you, it, uh, it, whatever conclusion you come to, if you're trusting Christ alone for salvation, you are my brother and sister in Christ. I don't say that lightly. I mean that. I believe we're one body and we should show each other grace and liberty. And if we disagree on this, ultimately, we can agree to disagree without being disagreeable. So let's just try to show each other. I know this is a hot topic and it may stir up emotion, but let's quiet that flesh voice down and try to hear one another. And if you can't, if you don't agree, at least understand why that person thinks that way. So please show us some grace to one another uh, in the chat room tonight and and always. Uh, thanks for having me, you guys. Uh, Jack Smack, awesome to have you with us, brother. Okay, great. Uh, and I'm looking in the chat room and seeing the comments. Uh, Brother Jack Smack, uh, you, you probably don't have access to that. Uh, the technology that Brother Jack Smack is using is is uh, not high tech enough. Uh, we're just, I have him on my phone. So you're listening through uh, the telephone conversation with us. And, uh, <clears throat> but I will tell you, Brother, uh, that uh, there are quite a few people in the chat room that are making comments that they're very, very happy that you could be with us. Uh, and it's a, it's a rare pleasure. I hope we can do this more often. Okay, let's get into the, 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 the subject matter. Um, first of all, let me say that uh, we have a lot of ground to cover and we're gonna go very, very quickly through a lot of scriptures. And the reason uh, I, I'm, I'm saying this now is, is because my foundation for everything I believe is what we call sola scriptura. That means only scripture. 
all my conclusions on theology are based upon what the scriptures say. So this Bible here, this KJV Bible here, this is what I'm relying on for my truth. And I, put, I think I can say the same thing for Jack Smack and for Sister Renee. Uh, so when it comes to uh, the creation account in Genesis, uh, I take it as truth. Uh, when it comes to Jonah and the whale, I take that as truth. Uh, when it comes to the flood and the Noah's Ark, I take that as truth. Uh, and when it, when it comes to whatever it says about the subject of hell, the subject of what is the state of the dead, the subject of what is the fate of the lost, I go to the scriptures. Whatever the scriptures say, that's what I'm going to go with. Uh, we got a lot of scriptures to, to go through. So, Brother Jack Smack, as uh, concisely as you can, I just reply to what I just said about the, my conclusion that, hey, let's just believe what the scriptures say instead of going with uh, whatever tradition says. You still with us? Well, yeah, uh, I agree with that. I just think we have to understand the context as well, though, because a lot of people are just making the scripture say whatever they want it to because it fits their tradition, and that would be you know, the opposite of what we're doing. So I believe we have to take the, the verses literally and in the proper context. Amen. Amen. Uh, okay, Sister Renee, uh, would you uh, take the same approach that we take here, and you're going to base your conclusions only on the scriptures? Yeah, everything is uh, sola scriptura. But here, like he just said, people put in their own belief systems into the scripture instead of like pulling out what the scripture actually says. Uh, and I also would like to say the studies we've all done on this have been for at least a year or years on this. And we also keep in mind always context and always what did the people in the first century believe on this topic? Uh, were there what were their general beliefs in this area and uh, if if it changed when did it change and by whom and why so I, I, I like to keep those things in consideration when we're uh, checking out stuff okay Amen. those are wise words by both of you thank you uh, now uh, I find the the uh, as far as my conclusions uh, you'll you'll find out as we go along my position on this but my my conclusion is that uh, the, the problem um, uh, really is that um, the, there's a premise that we've all heard in churches. And I, if you haven't heard this, I'd be very surprised. And that is that man has an immortal soul. And uh, because man's soul is immortal and will definitely live on forever, the question is, will after you die, will your soul live on? in heaven or will your soul live on in hell? Uh, but that's the first thing I wanna question. And so let's go to the Bible and see, what does the Bible actually say about man's immortality, the immortality of the soul? And so uh, we're going to, uh, I'm just gonna go through a lot of verses tonight with it, with these uh, br brother and sister and, and I want you to respond to what the verses. I'm going to try to read them in a way that I, I'm going to emphasize the words that are, are more pertinent to this study tonight. So let's look at Genesis 3, 22 through 24. It says, and the Lord God said, behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Renee, what's your, what's the significance of those verses there? Uh, to me, it's saying that God, that man is not immortal without God giving that to him. Mm -hmm. Bro Brother Jack Smack. Um, uh, hang on. Yeah, he's just saying that you know, we have a soul and it's going to live on forever. And I, like she said, it's, it's granted, you know, those who have eternal life. <clears throat> Okay, my thoughts on this in Genesis is the first indication that we have that 
um, Adam and Eve did not have immortality uh, and they were prevented from accessing immortality through the tree of life. Uh, God kept them away from the tree of life lest they would gain immortality and live forever. So I think this is our first indication in the Bible that man does not inherently, innately have immortality. Now let's look at 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16. Luke, I, I just want I just wanted to say one thing there that that was a mercy. It wasn't a, really a judgment. It was a mercy lest we be immortal in a fallen state, in a fallen body. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I agree with that. Well, now let's get your thoughts on this. First Timothy 6, 15 and 16, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Okay, Renee, I emphasize this portion, who only hath immortality. Yeah, it, it's so clear in scripture that man does not have an immortal soul without Jesus. We don't have eternal life without Jesus. Uh, that's the gift of immortality. I used to believe in the immortal soul but found that that came in through uh, paganism, came in through philosophers like Plato and Augustine and the Catholic Church brought that doctrine in. And it's clear in scripture here that only God is immortal. He has no beginning and no end. And that is not the case with human beings unless Jesus gives us that eternal life. Yes. Amen. So, Brother Jack Smack, in this, these verses, it's, it's referring to God, and it says, who only hath immortality. It's saying that only God has immortality. And uh, is there any other way of understanding that? Well, no, unless you're, I mean, taking people out that are saved, I mean, we have immortality as well. Oh, yes, yes. It comes from God as the source of the provenience of it, yeah. Amen, amen. And, but, okay, let me ask you, then, since you brought that up, the very next verse pertains to that. Here's 1 Corinthians 15, verses 53 and 54. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. When this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. That is exactly what you're referring to, Brother Jack Smack. Tell me more about those verses. Well, what it states is that um, all, all people in this natural state are corrupt. That's why we have to put on the incorruption, and that would be eternal life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. Uh, I, I would say on, uh, I've studied this extensively, and if anybody can prove me wrong, please uh, let me know. There is no verse in the Bible that says man inherently has immortality. But there are these verses that are saying only God has it, and that only man, man does not have it unless he receives it by uh, faith in Jesus. Uh, so, Sister Renee, your thoughts on that? Sorry, are you, are you basically saying conditional mortality? That's the term. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, that's the, the common term that uh, we, we I, I've come to agree with, that uh, viewpoint. It's called conditional immortality. Uh, mankind is not innately immortal. Right. He can become immortal, as Brother Jack Smack said, but it's conditioned upon faith in Jesus. Sister? Right. Yeah, absolutely. It says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So yeah. you can't have everlasting life without faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. So the reason these verses here are so important is because there is a teaching that we've uh, I mentioned in the beginning. That is that man is a naturally born immortal our soul will live on forever and therefore you're going to live forever in heaven or forever in hell but that's not really what the bible says the bible says we're mortal and we can put on mortality uh, on one condition it's faith in jesus okay brother jack's back any more thoughts before we move forward well i mean that depends on your viewpoint 
point of hell, if you consider hell life, then it would be, you know, inherent immortality. But I don't consider hell life, I consider death, destruction. But that's a different issue. Yeah. And like the, the law of, uh, what's it, the, uh, the law of conservation of energy states that energy can either be destroyed or created. So I do believe in some sense, I don't think that anything exists that can just cease from existing, because uh, I just don't think that's possible. But that's another issue. But okay. But, uh, all right. Well, mortality, as you're defining it, yes, it's, it's something granted. <laughs> okay, let's get let's move on then. Now, um, I, I said that in the beginning that uh, we're going to go through a lot of verses because uh, I, I'm not going to base my conclusion on uh, church fathers uh, or uh, extra biblical writings or philosophers. I'm going to base my my conclusion entirely on what the Bible says. So we're just looking at verses, and then you come to your own conclusion as I have. Um, so a uh, couple of points uh, to consider here. Um, it, it, if, if a man did have immortality without faith in Jesus, then that would put God in the position where he's unable to put an end to, um, uh, to, to the sinner and the punishment because it would be impossible to terminate some, uh, a, a soul if it was immortal and would live on forever. So it makes God a little... Uh, impotent, uh, impotent, and also that uh, there is no uh, torture or imprisonment. As we go through these Old Testament verses, you're going to find out all these verses that we're going to uh, cite now that are uh, apply to the um, the fate of the wicked. Uh, nothing in the Old Testament and nothing in Mosaic law uh, if, is. If, is there a provision for any imprisonment or any uh, torture? The only thing that we see in these verses that we're going over is destruction. So first of all, Ezekiel 18.20 says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Brother Jack Smack? Well, once again, I'm not trying to adhere to tradition, but I mean, I believe that's talking about physical death, but that's, that's, the, that's my take on it. That, that could be. I mean, uh, sometimes the word soul refers to just a, a living being. Like there was a, a, a plane crash and they say there, there were uh, 100 souls lost, uh, you know, referring to people. Uh, that, that's fair. You could, you could interpret that way. Uh, I believe that it uh, uh, refers to our soul, but we'll, there's no way of really determining that. Sister Renee? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of verses with the context of physical destruction all through the Old Testament when it's talking about nations. I'm glad you brought that up. I just want to say something quickly. You said we're not basing our beliefs on the church fathers. I'd like to clarify this is scripture alone. But when I say we check out what was believed then, my point is we have to understand the idioms and the metaphoric language that was common back then. And then we have to let the Bible interpret itself. Uh, we don't just have our own modern American view of what certain verses say. We have to look at the Bible and see, okay, back then, what was this figure of speech? What was this idiom? Was it common? And in what other ways is it referencing things? So uh, I think that's it. Um, important to know too yeah but there's a lot of verses about people being destroyed and dying but uh i believe that uh it, it sin brings death that's physical death to anyone saved or unsaved because it's destructive in our lives mm -hmm. it can lead to physical death uh spiritual death financial death all kinds of stuff but for the unsaved uh they suffer the second death you know that's why it says they're twice yeah. dead so yeah, uh, we're, we've got a lot of verses, uh, but I, I, what I want to emphasize is that I would not draw my conclusion necessarily from one verse unless it was so explicit that it would solve our problem. But uh, uh, what I, I want everybody to consider is as we go through these verses in the Old Testament, and then we'll get to the New Testament verses next, but as we go through all these verses, you're going to get a, a broad picture of the, what the Bible actually says about the uh, the fate of the wicked. So it uh, says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Deuteronomy 4.24 says, the Lord thy God is a consuming fire. Brother Jack Smack, what, what's your thoughts on God being a consuming fire? Well, it could be anything. I mean, it could just be 
just mean a guy is a wrathful God at the points and it's like fire. I mean, okay, all right, yeah, it, it's not there's it, it doesn't go into any more detail than that, but uh, Sister Renee. Sorry, I, I didn't say that again. I'm sitting right here, but just your thoughts on the next verse. Uh, the, the Lord thy God is a consuming fire. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, I've actually used that before. I think that God consumes whatever is not of Him. Uh, so uh, yeah, it doesn't for me, it doesn't say God is a fire that will uh, in your immortal body torture you for all of eternity. If you're in His presence and your sin you're destroyed yeah. it's not of god in his presence that's what i believe well, we're, we're later on we're going to go into more uh detail about the significance of uh, this being god being a consuming fire uh deuteronomy 9 3 says understand therefore this day that the lord thy god is uh, he which goeth over before thee as a consuming fire he shall destroy them and he shall bring them down before thy face face so shalt thou drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord hath said unto thee. Uh, I'll give you my thoughts on this first this time. And that first of all, it's, I'm getting the impression that God's way is to, uh, uh, as a consuming fire, it's completely consumed and, and destroying quickly. That's God's way. God is, does not destroy you over, uh, you know, days, weeks, months, years, over eternity, God's way, as we'll see in these scriptures, is to destroy quickly. Brother Jack Smack. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I mean, it makes sense about it being a consuming fire as opposed to some other type of fire. Yes. Yeah. Hey, I also wanted to say, uh, viewer mentioned this is good, that God is an all-consuming fire and that he also refines people. His fire refines us. That's why it says there'll be reprobate silver. Uh, and then it says be gold as gold tried by fire. So I believe the fire of God also cleanses us when we're saved. He He consumes all that is not of him so that we're refined mm -hmm. uh, and cleansed. Okay. Uh, but as I said, we could we could try to land, analyze the verse very, very uh, um acutely but what i really hoping people will understand is get the general broad picture of what the bible is telling us about the 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 fate and how god deals with the wicked and it's not imprisonment it's not torture it's destruction quickly psalm 37 verse uh 37 through uh uh no uh, chapter 37 uh, verses uh eight through no, I've got several different verses here. It says, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth for yet a little while and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place and it shall not be, but the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of the lamb. They shall consume into smoke. They shall consume away. Renee, if we're if we're looking at the overall counsel of God, it seems to be that His character is that He destroys His enemies. He destroys them. Uh, yeah. And again, if we're not immortal, uh, immortality is still immortality. It's just in pain. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, Brother Jack Smack, uh, the, the picture here, uh, cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Evil doers shall be cut off. Wicked shall not be. Wicked shall perish. Shall be as a fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke. They shall... Uh, smoke shall they consume away what's the picture god's telling us there well once again i think this is a reference to physical people because it says in first peter 124 for all flesh is as grass so we see the metaphor of grass being a destroyer or you know i think of it as just people it's, it's mentioned it's referencing their flesh that talks about the flower of grass 
perhaps Some, wither if the flower there or yeah, falls away. Yeah, yeah. I, I just don't see it as an eternal. Um, you know, it may not be. It may not be. It doesn't. It doesn't really specify. But what it does tell me uh, is a general con uh, a premise of, about God. The way God is uh, is telling us that the, the fate is going to be finality. It's not. There's nothing in here, and you're not going to find anything in the Old Testament that you uh, you can cite to support. He's going to torture you forever and ever and ever. Everything that uh, we are going to go over here that describes what God does to the wicked is they're completely destroyed. Let's go to Psalm one four. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Brother Jack Smack, you can go first on that one. Psalm, Psalm what now? The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Okay. Well, yeah, it's, it's saying the same thing. I mean, <clears throat> that they're completely rid of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I represent that. Yeah, yeah. Renee, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what Jack Smack said. Well, he was agreeing that, that it's a picture of that they're completely. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of people, so. a lot of people think because something says eternal fire that it means that you burn it burns forever. But uh, Sodom and Gomorrah were the story with eternal fire, and they're supposed to be an example of the judgment of the lost. So if you take what you're saying uh, to say these are shadows of how he destroys or consumes, then yeah, I'd agree with that because the Bible clearly states that one thing can be used as a shadow of an upcoming event. What well, I'm hoping that everybody will understand is if you go through the Old Testament, there's really no reference to hell, but there are a lot of references like these to God's way of dealing with evil. And it's total destruction. It says the godly are not so. That tells me that they don't exist anymore. They're like chaff, which the wind driveth away. That tells me it's destroyed. It doesn't even exist anymore. Psalm 2, 9 says, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Of course, Brother Jack Smack, uh, we, could, uh, we could just say that applies to just destroying their bodies. But it, it also just tells me of how God deals with them. He doesn't torture them. There's, there's no indication in these verses that God's torturing anybody, right? Yeah, I mean, it says perish in verse 6 of chapter 1. I mean, yeah, I mean, you're correct on that. I just, like I said, I'm just... <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't want to make it say more than it does. And it may very well be either some or most of these may even be talking about destruction of their bodies. But it also tells me that uh, there's no reverence of God, uh, you know, slowly torturing people. God's way is to destroy. Uh, so let's look at, uh, oh, Sister Ray, Psalm 2.9, your thoughts on that one? All right, I'll go on. Psalm 21.9 says, Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. The, yep, Lord yep. Sh yep. the Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. Yep. Right? Every, every time it's mentioned, it's always uh, destruction, perishing, devouring, consuming. It's always, uh, a fire is always, eternal fire is always described as having that effect. Yeah. Uh, I just ask anybody if you can find any verses in the Old Testament that, that say that uh, God's going to imprison or torture people, let me know. All the verses I'm finding that, that apply, that God's talking about how he's going to deal with wicked people, it says, the fire shall devour them. Uh, them and here's Psalm 58, uh, 7. Let them melt away as waters which run continually. When he bendeth his bow to shoot his arrows, let them be as cut in pieces. Brother Jack Smack? Hang on. Yeah, I mean, 
mean, even the idea of the next verse says that they're melting away. I mean, when you don't think of the snail just melting into some type of a, you know, purulent, you know, type of matter, and then it just stays there forever. But I mean, like I said, I, I, I'm not so sure these apply to eternal, eternal destiny, but anyway. Yeah, okay, well, well they'll read the, I, sorry, I should have read further. The next verse does say, as a snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away, like the untimely birth of a woman, that they may not see the sun. Um, okay, so Renee, uh, I, I'm, I keep on uh, mentioning this, uh, trying to phrase this in a way so that people understand the, the point I'm trying to make with all these verses, which the verses are telling me. It's not that I'm trying to make it, it's just that, that I'm, I'm getting out of the verses is God's description of how the, what happens to the to the wicked or the lost is a uh, is a picture of a sudden destruction. Yeah, every time, every time uh, they're destroyed, consumed. It's mm -hmm. permanent. When the worm dieth not, it, it's that it's permanent. You're dead. Uh, I think it's it's bizarre to redefine the second death as something other than the second death, the physical mm -hmm. death. And then after judgment, permanent death of the soul. Uh, so, uh, again, pe people, uh, I dis differ with you on that, you know, about there, there will be some judgment worse than others, but it will not be forever. There will be an end to it. It will be terrible and horrible, and we don't know how long, but it will consume. It, it, that's what see, the scripture seems to say, is that it, they will be consumed. Yeah. Uh, we, we're we're putting our interpretation on what words mean. Yeah, uh, okay. here's, uh, here's one. Let me ask Brother Jack Smack here. Psalm 68, 2. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. Jack Smack? What verse that again? I'm looking, I'm looking right at the Bible this time. I mean, this is Psalm 68 2. It's my computer already messed up. This, this screen's already shut down. Psalm 68 2. It says, 68, and, Okay, hang on, hang on. You lost the notes? Yeah, I see. Well, I have my Bible. The notes, the, they clicked out for some reason. The, my computer just does whatever it wants, it just clips the stuff off sometimes. Okay, as the smoke is driven away, so drive them away, as whack melt before the fire. Yeah, I mean, yeah, all these verses are saying is the same thing, that they'll be completely annihilated. Yeah. Well, the, the end of this verse says, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. Okay, let's go on to the next yeah. one, Psalm 69, 28. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not written with the righteous. Sister Renee. Well, let them be in the book of the wicked and not with the righteous. Don't you have the notes there? And are, did you, you no, I don't. I don't. Why don't you have the notes? Did you email them? Oh, I may have mailed them to you twice. But here, okay, I'll, they're on I'll, email then. I thought they were going to be right here. I will pull them up so I don't let do me, Let me read it to you again then, okay? okay. It says, uh -huh. let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Yep. Not written with the righteous. Right. Uh, and I, I also want to mention, because people try to, well, while we have the opportunity, people try to say, see, that proves you can lose salvation. You're blotted out. No, all pe he died for all people. But if you reject it, then you're then you're blotted out. It's not that you were written down and then blotted out because you messed up. So I did want to say that. But it's clear that they are the dead. They are not the living. Jesus said he is the God of the living, not the dead. Yeah, but to me, when they're blotted out of the book of the living, it means that they they, they no longer they, exist. Yeah, they no longer exist. That's that's mm -hmm. exactly because the Lamb's book of life is different from the book of life. Yeah, the book of life is book of the living. I I agree. It means that you're alive. Okay, I, brother Jack Smack, uh, listen to this uh, carefully. This one, Psalm eighty three thirteen. Oh my God, right. make make them as a wheel, as the stubble before the wind. They're talking about um, complete annihilation, complete destruction, complete obliteration. But I'll get into—I mean, I'll get into some reasons why I'm, I'm not 
in the discussion, but I'll give you some other reasons why I'm not holding to this. But like, you know, but these verses are saying exactly what you, what you say they are. Yeah. Yeah, we're not going to find anything in the Old Testament that gives any indication of uh, uh, torture or torment. Everything in the Old Testament tells us that God destroys. Um, Psalm 94, 23, and Renee, listen here, and he shall bring upon them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness, yea. I found the notes. It was on my other email. I'm so sorry I didn't pull those up. Okay, well, if you scroll down to Psalm 94, 23. Uh-huh, and he shall bring upon them their own inequity and shall cut them off. And their word cut off means to be destroyed, to die. Yes. Uh, it's, it is clear, Jackson Mike Wright, these are talking about physical death in the Old Testament. He's talking about destroying Israel's enemies, clearly. But like you said, these are also clearly said to be in samples of judgment to come ultimately in the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. that and, it, and it's teaching us how God deals with wicked. I don't see any example of God dealing with wicked by torturing them or imprisoning them. Well, when you study, the reason people are coming to this is one, they assume man's immortal, which is not biblical. And two, because they don't understand like the metaphoric idioms, like forever and ever and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but that just means it's permanent. It's yeah. permanent. It will ne they'll never escape there. It's yeah. done. It'll never stop. It doesn't yeah. mean torture will never stop. We, we, we've, got, we've got those verses coming up near the end of our talk tonight, but it's uh, the point is you're right. The, the problem is people, uh, if they believe that man is born immortal, and that his soul has to go on living somewhere, then they have a problem because it, then they got to say, well, it's not in heaven, got to be continue existing in hell. And while they're existing there, they're being tortured because of a few verses that we'll go over at the end here. Now, this one says, um, Psalm 139, 19, surely thou wilt slay the wicked. O God, depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. Jack Smack. Uh, Psalm 139, 19. 139, 19. Okay. Yeah. Renee, while he's looking for it, go and tell me your thoughts on it. Renee? My thing was sticking. Yeah, I'm trying to uh, pull things up and get this working. Um, surely that will slay the wicked. Slay the wicked. That's the one we're on, right? Yeah. 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 Slay the wicked. Uh, the kill. God's, God's kill. slaying them. He's not torturing them or imprisoning them. Kill. He kills yeah. the wicked. So the, the, the idea is um, eternal torment in hell is, is imprisonment forever and with, along with torture. But everything we're seeing here, the way God deals with wicked, there's no imprisonment. There's no torture. It's slaying. It's destroying. It's making them stubble before the wind. Okay, let's go to Isaiah 51, 8. Uh, For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. Jack Smack? That's Isaiah 51, 8. Yeah, I'm there. Yeah, it has the connotation of uh, being devoured or, or eating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, in other words, the, the, a worm eats them and destroys the wool. The worm does not continue eating the wool over and over again for eternity. The worm eats the wool and just destroyed. That's how I'm at. I see this. Let, uh, Renee, let's look at Malachi 4.1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh uh, shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch, and ye shall tread down the wicked, and they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet, 
in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Jack yeah. Smack, if you want to look it up, let me give that as Jack Smack, as uh, Malachi chapter 4, uh, beginning with verse 1. And that's obviously prophetic. It, yeah, were you asking me or Jack Smack? Dan? I'm asking you, but I'm giving him a oh. chance to look it up. because Oh, doesn't. okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it's clear he's talking about a future event in which God will destroy the enemies. Uh, but uh, I, again, it's just another verse showing that that's what God does to his enemies. He destroys them. Death is death, I believe. It's death. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, we're not immortal. That's why we suffer the second death. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jack Smack, you, you have that, Malachi? Yeah, I, the same thing. I agree with what you said. It's just all these verses are saying the exact same thing about you. Yeah. Now, when I uh, one of the main principles. Now, we've we've all uh, studied the Bible and taught the Bible a long time, and there's a lot of different uh, principles that we need to bring uh, and apply as we study it. One of the principles that uh, I believe is most important is you do not uh, base your conclusions based upon verses that are ambiguous, and especially if there's one or two verses that are ambiguous about something. You base your your conclusion upon verses that are clear and explicit, and if the same point is repeated over and over and over again. And what we're seeing here is it's clearly stating over and over again, the Old Testament, God deals with the wicked by destroying them, and there's all kinds of literary ways of describing how God destroys the wicked. There's no picture we're getting of God imprisoning and torturing the wicked. Okay, Renee? Okay, uh, Jack Smack, here, go with Job 3415. Can you look that up? It's, it's a short Job, one. Job 3415, it's short, I'll just read it. It says, all flesh shall perish, and man shall turn again into dust. Of course. Yeah, we, we it that. says what it says. It says, it says oh. flesh. Okay. Yeah. Okay, it's... so now, now we're ready to move on to the verses in the New Testament. What can we learn from the New Testament verses about this question? What, how does God deal with the wicked and the lost, okay? Uh, New Testament, let's look at 2 Peter 3, 9. God does not desire that any of us should perish. Brother Jack Smack, what do you think when you, when you think of that? God does not desire that any of us should perish. Well, I don't, well, to me personally, this doesn't have anything to do with, with the nature of hell. This has to do with the fact that he doesn't want people going there. He wants people to be saved. Doesn't want anyone to perish. Well, you're having. Of whether it's eternal or not. Yeah, but I think that you're. Uh, one thing I've always given you credit for. I think you're the most. Um, uh, you have the the greatest vocabulary of anybody I've I've known personally, uh, and you know that words have definitions, and uh, perish means that you no longer exist. That's how I would define perish. If you perish, you don't exist. You just you're destroyed. And so this word perish is important, and I think that that means that God does not desire any perish, but all should come to repentance, and is the rest of it. But uh, Renee, what do you think of that word perish? We're going to be seeing that uh, repeatedly. I mean, it's clear what perishing is. It means perish is to destroy. When you have food perish, it decays. It eventually turns to nothing. It tur <laughs> returns to dust. Uh, any kind of organic material that perishes uh, returns to the to basically ashes to the atomic level, pretty much. I mean, if you find old graves, they're all their skins gone. It's that they perish. It's the it, it's destroyed. It no longer exists. Yeah. That's what perish means to be destroyed. Yeah. Well, let's look at Second Peter two twelve. It says, but these, as natural brute beasts, may be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they, are, that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. So we're going to see the word perish and destroyed. This is the, these are the vocabulary that we find in the New Testament when it talks about the, the lost. Um, um, so Jack Smack, uh, in that verse, it's talking about how they will be destroyed and they will utterly perish. Utterly. And what verse was 2 Peter 2, what now? 2.12. 2, okay. Yeah. 
And uh, Renee, I'll ask you to comment on this while we're waiting for him to find that. Is it John 315, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Well, it makes it clear there that the opposite of perishing is to have eternal life. So you don't have eternal life without Jesus. You get eternal life believing on Jesus. If you don't believe on Jesus, you perish. It tells you the two options right there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you can talk about both of these verses uh, now, uh, Jack Smack. Uh, the one in Second Peter and then John 3.15. And might as well go on to John 3.16 too, where it says uh, that, your, your options are to either perish or have everlasting life. Well, well you there? Yeah. If you take the word perish in the Greek, though, it does not always mean to, to cease from existing. It can also mean to just like she said decay, but I guess that would lead to, to perishing. But um, I don't know. Um, I'm just trying to play devil's advocate. Yeah, well, that's fine. I mean, I don't, know. I don't want to add any other verses to it. So we can in the discussion, so we can do that. I, yeah, it does say perish, and I guess perish has a a plethora of different meanings or nuances of meaning. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. But if we look at that and then look at uh, destroyed uh, in the previous verse, and then we contrast uh, either you will perish or you'll have everlasting life. As Renee said, um, everlasting life is one thing and then perish is the other. Uh, that, that, that would indicate to me that uh, you don't have life anymore. You've perished. Um, okay. Let's look at Matthew uh, 7, 13. Uh, Renee, you can go first on this. Uh, uh, Matt, uh, Jack Smack, is, is look up Matthew 7, 13. It says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So we have one group, leading into destruction, the other group leading into life. Renee? Yep, I think this is one of the most twisted verses out there because people think the narrow gate is some process they do. Uh, I'm going to walk the narrow road. No, you, the narrow way is Christ. The, the way is a person, not a process. So it's clear here that uh, there's one way, which is Jesus, that leads to life life mm -hmm. the other one is the opposite of life which is death so it says uh one road leads to destruction the other leads to life everlasting again confirming the immortality as given by god i just want to say there's a few people in the chat room i think we should you know acknowledge it as it goes there's a lot of people saying oh we're mortal but our spirit isn't yeah, but the spirit returns to God who gave it. People people seem to... Anyway, I, I'm glad we're dispelling this because there's I'm so... Not, I don't want to try to go back and forth with the chat room or anybody to try to win an argument now. What I want to do is show everybody all the verses right. and then they can come to their own conclusion. Right, exactly. And again, we're just saying what we think scripture is saying. Yeah, um, I don't... I don't life think that, and death are the options. Yeah, I, I, I suspect that most people... We're not even aware of all the verses in the Old Testament that tells how God deals with evil and he destroys it. He doesn't torture and, and imprison. And now we're in the New Testament verses and we see this, this terminology. You'll either be destroyed or you'll have life. That's, uh -huh, that's it. Destruction uh, or perishing or everlasting life. That's yeah. it. Life or death. Jack, Jack, Matthew 7, 13. What's your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I mean. I know, I know the verse I mean, I'm just saying the word destruction is there, but I mean. And let me ask you something. If, if we were not, if we were not. I'm not trying to argue something, I mean, you're not at that point yet. But What's that? I'm saying that they, 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 they do denote finality. Yeah. Now, if we were not having a Bible talk right now, but you and and uh, that was not the subject at all of discussion, and someone was talking to you about something with uh, absolute destruction, it was totally destroyed, it perished. Well, you would you wouldn't think it'd go on go on forever and ever in some uh, you know bad state. Well, you wouldn't you think it just was totally destroyed and perished? Well, not by that verse, I wouldn't. But there are verses that say eternal, that say eternal destruction. That's what I'm talking about. We'll save that for the argument part. Yeah, yeah. 
But yeah, but yeah, but you're right. It doesn't say that in this verse. Okay, but so far here in the New Testament, we see we're given a choice between destroyed, uh, the terms being used are destroyed and perishing. And then we have a choice between perishing and eternal life, uh, a choice between perishing and everlasting life, a choice between destruction and leading to life. And now we'll go to Matthew 10, 28. Um, Matthew 10, 28, brother uh, Jack Smack. Let me ask Renee first, I'll give it to you. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Yeah, it's right? clear right there. He he says it, it's to be destroyed is to be killed. To be yeah. killed. He defines it himself. Uh, and, and that God destroys both body and soul. It, it, it says right there. And what does destroy mean? That you're tortured forever? No. He kills and you're killed. It says right there. Don't fear the one that can kill, and then it says destroy. I mean, there's so many perish, kill, destroy. They are self-evident. I don't know why we have redefined what death and perish and destruction means. Well, I think it's because of the point that we made when we first started, that if someone believes that a person has an, an immortal soul, then it's got to go on living somewhere. Right. So therefore, you're, you're forced to come up with... Uh, uh, looking at these words in a way we would not normally look at them. We but you just normally, showed verses proven we're not immortal. Yeah, we would not normally associate the words destroy and perish uh, as something that's continuing. It's it's no. done. Yeah, uh, Brother Jack Smack, uh, Matthew 10, 28, you have it there? Yeah, it's saying, it's evidence you guys are saying, I'm not disputing that, but I mean, my, my question is, what about demons and the devil? I mean, they're not going to carry well, forever. I mean, Jack Smack, uh, on, on the notes... Yeah, on the notes I sent you, that that uh, that's at the end of our notes here. We're going to get to that. Yeah, that's what I'm waiting for because <laughs> I've just got some other things to say about this. Oh, okay. Well, uh, now let's look at Matthew 13, 40. Matthew 13, 40, Jack Smack. Uh, Renee, I'll read it to you first. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. What, you, what do you think when you think of the words, the weeds being burned up in the fire and comparing that to the end of the age for people? I don't see where any weeds uh, continue to exist after they're burned up. I mean, I don't know how many times you can say you'll be as ashes, you're destroyed, you're, you perish, it's the second death. You, I, I, I mean, even Jude explains it. And when we get to that, I'm going to show that to people. But I, I never, until I did this study, I didn't realize how many places it's clear that only God's immortal, man is not immortal, and that it's the second death, the perishing, and the only couple of verses they use are idioms mm -hmm. that, that are actually uh, defined by the Bible itself to not mean what both, most people think they mean. Uh huh. Okay, uh, Jack Smack, you got Matthew 13, 40? Yeah, I'm looking at it. What picture? What picture? It would conclusion. Yeah, it's, it's uh, definitely a picture of of, of, of these things of the tears perishing. But I mean, you have to also understand that it's a parable. I mean, he's always speaking parabolically. And, yeah. yeah, it does. It does say that. Though. I mean, that's that's true. It, it, if it is a parable, you can't put as much confidence in the in the uh, your conclusion because parables are not necessarily understandable all the time. Now let's look at uh, Jack Smack. Look up Galatians six eight. Renee, you go first. I'll read it to you. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. Yeah, uh, this a lot of people try to say, see, if you uh, if you w uh, work and live right in your body, you won't go to hell. But that's not what it's saying. Uh, it can mean two things. I have to see the whole context. But Galatians is clearly the whole book is saying, no, it's not by works. It's not by works. It's not by works. It's not by works. It's a free gift. <laughs> so um, the fact here is he also explains that those that don't trust Christ don't even have the spirit. Mm -hmm. They don't even have the spirit. So if they're walking by flesh, it means they're trying to earn salvation by the performance of the law, which is explained in also in Romans mm -hmm. for that. That's what that means. So to me, He's saying that you're destroyed. Now, it can mean us that if you're saved, 
you suffer that sin brings physical death to anybody saved or unsaved because it's a destructive force in our lives but to the unsaved it brings destruction permanent destruction mm -hmm. i i think destruction can't be redefined as yeah. something that goes on forever it won't be pleasant but it's not going on for all of eternity yeah so we have uh, jack smack we have one group reaping corruption another group reaping life everlasting how do you picture that well i don't think this has anything to do with um uh, with us i mean it's talking about if we suck the flesh we'll reap corruption that's some of physical death for either say what she said either say to the answer i think it's talking about winning souls but this is a, a unique way of looking at it because you have to be in a spiritual mode or mindset to win a soul and then you'll reap everlasting life for them because if, it, if, you, if, it's, if it's about us then mm -hmm. it, it doesn't make any sense because we already have everlasting life how yeah. do we reap something we already have yeah okay uh now now we're going to move on to a, a, a a little different uh, point, and that is the I the idea of God being a consuming fire. In uh, Deuteronomy 4.24, it says again, the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, and it's repeated in Hebrews 12.29, 20, for our God is a consuming fire. Uh, now, when we th think of fire, and we'll, let's refer to it as a lake of fire, People use the word hell, but we know that the lake of fire uh, is, uh, none of us dispute that there's a lake of fire that people will go into. So what happens to these people in that lake of fire? Uh, there are three possibilities. There is the fire that torments. That's what some people would argue that they're gonna to be tormented or tortured in the fire forever and ever. Uh, or there's a fire that purges. That's where people think, well, it's only temporary, like a Roman Catholic, that would be purgatory. Your sins are purged, and people will stay in that and be uh, purged. Uh, they're, uh, let's say, tormented and burning in fire for whatever long it takes. And uh, eventually, everybody gets, gets cleansed through this fire purging, and that would be universalism, universal salvation. And then there's the other, the final viewpoint is that the, the uh, uh, fire is consuming. And that would be that when people go into the lake of fire, that they're actually consumed. And so the in Deuteronomy, it says God is a consuming fire. So I, I apply the fire as something that consumes rather than something that purges or something that, uh, that uh, torments forever. Uh, one more verse to consider on this is Deuteronomy 9.3. Uh, Jack Smack, why don't you look up Deuteronomy 9.3, and I'll read it for Renee. Understand, therefore, this day that the Lord thy God is he who goeth over before thee a consuming fire. He shall destroy them, and he shall bring them down before thy face. So shalt thou drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord hath said unto thee. Renee? It's obvious it's destroy. They're going to be destroyed. Uh, again, I think even if he's talking about destruction physically here on earth, uh, like Jude says, it's an ensample for what will happen to the wicked. They will be destroyed. So clear, it's destroyed, perish, death. So when we, when we see that the Bible refers to God as a consuming fire, it should settle that, that the fire is not purgatory. The fire is not torment. The right. fire is consuming. Uh, Brother I agree. Mac, Deuteronomy 9.3. I agree. Yeah, I'm looking at the Hebrew 12 reference. It says the same thing, destroyed. Yes. Okay. Uh, you want to say anything about Deuteronomy 9.3? Yeah, I'm saying it references that verse, and it says the word destroyed. Yeah, okay. Uh, and, but here's the – look, this, this, the, the, the reason this verse – you can learn so much from that single verse. It says, and destroy them quickly. I don't see any indication – that God destroys people slowly, especially not over an eternity. <laughs> God destroys quickly. Uh, well, look, here's, here's some verses that these are called examples. Examples God give us of what's going to happen to the, the in the end. He says, He says uh, in 2 Peter 
Brother Jack Smack, look up 2 Peter 2 6. I wish you had my notes. I think you because you wouldn't have to look up every verse. But well, I had them, but my, my computer deleted them, is what I was trying to tell you. It had a mind of its own. Uh, do you, uh, okay. Uh, um, uh, 2 Peter 2 6. I'll read it to Renee and she can go first then. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, not only does he say it, but Jude, uh, Jude and Peter both say something about this, that the eternal fire that comes destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. They call it eternal fire. And as a matter of fact, you'll see, I, I don't want to go too far ahead anyway, because I, I really want to answer this because a lot of people are asking it, but we'll do it after. Um, okay. It's clear to me that these things are an example of what will happen to the wicked. It is a foreshadow that he will destroy, consume, they'll perish. It yeah. tells that Sodom and Gomorrah is an example to what will happen to the lost. Yeah. Destroyed by eternal fire. It says it's eternal fire, but it's not still burning. Yeah. The, 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 this it's verse is, is saying, God is saying in this verse, listen, here's an example of what's going to happen in the future. Right. Lost. As Sodom and Gomorrah was turned into ashes, they were not just burning, being tortured forever and ever. They turned into ashes. And that's a picture of what's going to happen in the future for the lost. Uh, Brother Jack Smack. A, a reference to the physical death, but like I said, all the other verses are saying, you know. Okay, well, let's look at uh, you know, the, next, the next verse uh, Renee's anxious to talk about. So let's look at Jude verse uh, uh, 7. It, said, it says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire sister what does this eternal fire mean particularly? I'm saying the eternal fire means it's not a natural fire it comes from god himself it's a it comes from an eternal source so <clears throat> it's not like it, a, a fire was lit and it burned it up no fire from god himself came down it's from an eternal source and it talks about again with the idioms we need to be clear on these figures of speech that they had back then. Uh, it is said that the the cities that are destroyed, like Sodom and Gomorrah, that the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. But they're not still burning. Sodom and Gomorrah is not still burning. The, yeah. the other cities God destroyed, they're not still burning. It's a figure of speech saying that their destruction is permanent. That place or that people will never see life again. Yeah, the reason the reason I put this verse following the Deuteronomy verse about the Lord thy God is a consuming fire is because we need to understand that the consuming fire is God himself. And, and so when we look at where it says in Jude, there, there, there's an eternal fire. It's the fact that uh, eternal fire is God who is eternal. It's not the torment that is eternal. That's the important thing to understand. So we cannot use Jude 7 to say, look, it's eternal fire. Um, that's that's reference to who God is, God's eternal fire. Uh, Brother Jack Smack. Okay. Um, yeah, the word eternal can mean both, you know, bound by time and, you know, incessant, but I mean, I'm not going to get into the Greek and try to figure out which one it means, but yeah, it, it could mean both, and it could mean from a um, a supernal or um, ethereal source or a divine source, like from God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, here's something that a lot of people never considered, and I th I think this is a very valid point. Uh, it it has a it's a big factor in in understanding. Okay, uh, is there a fire that goes on forever? And people are being tormented in it forever and ever. Well, uh, I think that these verses would indicate uh, that it's not possible because the eternal state of the new creation will not permit it. Let's look at Revelation 21, verse 4. Uh, Brother Jack Smack, please look that up. Revelation 21, uh, 4. Uh, 21 4. Yeah, 21 4. Renee, 
let me th thought from this. And how does this how does this uh, support the idea that there will be no eternal torment? And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are gone away. Renee? Yeah. Uh, if if I don't know how God works, but if I knew people and I knew that for all eternity death was not swallowed up in victory. Death continues to be a victor because it's continually making these people die for all eternity, yet they don't get any death. That would surely make my heart ache, even if I was saved and in the presence of the Lord, to know people I loved are still in a million years going to be in torment. Yeah. So the fact that I believe that uh, we, we know that the lost are destroyed uh it's we're it's horrible we probably have tears over that but that god will heal our hearts over it mm -hmm. uh but the thought of seeing people these catholics with their paintings of looking down at the people being tortured while we're like going ha, 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 in heaven that's so wicked to me yeah. it's so wicked and, and now a person could argue well this verse is only talking about the people in heaven but uh, I, I, and that's how you applied it. How could we be happy without any sorrow if we if we knew that people are continuing to be tortured forever and ever? But I see it a little differently. I think this verse could be uh, applied more broadly to every everything. Yeah, all, all, all that exists, everything that exists in all of existence from this point on, there's no more sorrow or crying. If that's the case, then there can't be people being tortured who are crying and pain. There's a new heaven and a new earth. I mean, yeah. everything is new. How, yeah, why is that old stuff yeah, God can't them. destroy his enemies? It's almost like they think he can't destroy his enemies and get rid of them. Yeah. Uh, Jack Smack, Revelation 21 4, does that uh, prove anything? Well, I do believe this is only talking about, say, because it talks about his people in verse 3, and then it describes them in verse 1, the new heaven. Mm -hmm. I understand what you're saying, but I do believe this only applies to saved people. Okay, if it if it only applies to saved people, then my question would be, um, uh, how could we be in heaven and have no sorrow or crying if we knew that our loved ones were going were continuing to be tortured forever and ever? I I don't I don't know if I could be without any sorrow, uh, but maybe so. Let's look next at Revelation twenty one one. And uh, look that up, please, Jack. Renee, I'll read it to you. It says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. What does that tell you, Renee? But you said earlier that everything is new. All things are new. Uh, and I want to reiterate because somebody said, Renee, what happened to you being sola scriptura? What happened to you being only scripture, but you're believing this? Everything we have said is from scripture. We haven't had any source other than scripture. And there's only two verses that can even imply that somebody is tortured forever and ever. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to cover the verses that people. Scripture. Yeah. Near the end of this talk, we're going to cover the verses that people use to support eternal torment. But I want everybody to be aware of all the verses that I think seem to refute it. And, and people don't know about these verses. Now, yeah, like 50 verses or more. This is scripture alone. Yeah. I mean, we got 50 verses that are clear and uh, that it's uh, the, the everlasting punishment is destruction. It's permanent. You perish. You have the second death. Uh, uh, this is all scripture. It's yeah. other people and doctrines that have put their ideas that man is immortal to make that death something other than death. Yeah. You know? Okay. Let me, uh, Jack Smack, you got Revelation 21 one there. To, your thoughts, does that mean anything to this conversation? Yeah, once again, I don't think it's anything, anything to do with hell. I mean, it's talking about the new earth, or the old earth has passed away. It's yeah. Seen. Yeah. Well, I think as we go along, we're going to find out. I'm uh, My conclusion is, that uh, their hell uh, does not even exist anymore in eternity. But uh, let's go to Second Peter 3, verse 5 through 7. Can you look that up? I'll, I'll read it to Renee. Renee, 
For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are, are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment uh, and perdition of ungodly men reserved under fire. So this is another, what, what is uh, Peter doing here by comparing the flood to the fire? Yeah, the, uh, he's he's clearly saying, hey, everybody died during the flood and God's going to uh, do the same thing, except he's not using water. He's going to use fire this time. The mm -hmm. same thing's going to happen. They're all going to die. This is, I believe, obviously physical death of everyone, uh, everyone on earth. Yes. Uh, in this case, though, uh, he's talking about the destruction of the earth by fire. Uh, so, oh, yeah, yeah. new heaven and new earth is a whole new yeah. thing. All right, Jack Smack, Second Peter three five through seven. Well, I believe hell is in the center of the earth right now, but like I said, it's a holding cell, and the lake of fire is apart from that. I don't believe it's part of the earth. So, like I said, I just, I'm not seeing the uh, the pertinence to this whole. Torment. Why would the um, why would the uh, why would the center of the earth not be uh, considered part of the earth? No, well, the center of the earth is here. Is is, is hell? But the, I don't believe hell is the lake of fire at the same location. Oh, okay. All the right. So hell will be cast in the lake of fire. Yeah. Okay. So the lake of fire. So if if the lake of fire is in the center of the earth, let's let's take that as a point, and then look at this this verse here. It says linked to Second Peter three five linked to it. That last verse we just talked about, now we're going to compare this uh, verse here, 2 Peter 3, 12 through 13. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Uh, so, Renee, uh, this is talking about, I don't know, if you, do you take this part of scriptures literally? Do you believe that the heavens or uh, all of creation is going to catch on fire and be dissolved and the elements will melt away? And, uh, all of creation, everything is going to melt away? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I believe eventually everything will be recreated in its perfection without sin, without death, without pain. That's what I believe. Mm -hmm. I believe it's literal. Okay. All right. Uh, and Jack Smack, the, those verses there, do they? what do they tell you? 12 and 13. All right. Yeah. Uh, let me just say that on one hand, we have the heavens and the earth totally being dissolved and, 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 and not existing. They're dissolved. All of heavens and all of earth, that means all of the universe, every, all creation. And then it says, look for new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So there will be everything that we exist now is going to not exist, but God will recreate the, or the earth with the new heavens. If that's the case, there's no reference to him uh, creating another hell uh, that I can see. Jack Smith? Yeah, well, I mean, well I mean, what I'm saying is that he's creating a new, a new heaven and a new earth, but I, I don't think hell... Or, or the lake of fire is in the center of the earth. But I don't know. Like I said, I, I didn't see any correlation to, uh, to eternity with this. Okay. Now, the next portion of the talk, uh, uh, we're, we are going to go to the verses at the end here that people used to support uh, uh, eternal torment and uh, try to explain them uh, so the, the way that makes sense to us. Uh, but before we get on to that, I want to talk about a, a subject that people, um, they don't talk about it that much, but it, I think it is important. And we've been talking about uh, uh, applying all these verses here to what is the eternal state of the lost. People who never get saved, never receive eternal life. Uh, and in eternity, do they exist or not exist? Are they continue to be tormented or did they completely perish? That's what we've been talking about. Now we're going to, I'm going to ask the question, if someone dies today and then uh, between now 
and the resurrection and the judgment. There is a period of time, maybe it's days, weeks, years, centuries. There's going to be a period of time between our death today and the resurrection and the judgment. So in that period of time, it's called the intermediate state. Now, I believe that the intermediate state is the, the saved people are with God in heaven and the lost people are waiting uh, for the uh, the resurrection and their, their judgment. But that's what we're going to go into now. Now, here are some verses that uh, I, I'd like you to respond to based upon that, that question. What's happening to the people who died already and there's still no resurrection? Where are they now? What's happening to them? Because there are people who say that uh, when people die, that they there there is no consciousness, there is no conscious existence. They're not aware of anything until the resurrection. And I personally disagree with that. Let's see what the Bible says about that. Uh, let's look at First Thessalonians five twenty three. Can you find that, Brother Jack Smack? First Thessalonians five twenty three. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Renee. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me go first because I want to make you see how this applies to the conversation. There are people who believe that uh, uh, that we are not a triune being creating God's image, God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, yet one God. They don't believe that man has body, soul, and spirit. They think that you're, you have a body and you have a brain. And that's all. And when your brain dies, you have no consciousness until, you're, until you get a body back again. Uh, and then some people say, well, you have a body and a, and a spirit, but you don't have a soul. Your soul would be your consciousness, your identity. But in this verse here, if someone belie believes that, this verse should refute them because it yep, says yep. refers to your whole spirit and soul and body. Right? Yep, 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 yep. Spirit, spirit is the gift of life that God gave that returns to him. The soul is our mind, our will, our emotions, our memories, and the body is obviously a body. So um, I I disagree. I think you're I think the seventh day Adventists believe like you did that you said. But that they there's no consciousness, but we know that's not true because I believe uh, uh, that when Paul said to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord, he didn't know if it was better for him to stay here to be with them to help guide the church or to be absent from the body so he could be with God. That he was struggling. Should I stay here or should I go be with Jesus? And and uh, Stephen said, you know, take take my spirit. I commit my spirit to you. So I believe uh, that we do have conscious when the, the one verse they use is that the dead know nothing. But it's talking about the dead knowing nothing on the earth. They don't know what's happening here on earth. It doesn't mean they're not conscious where they are. Uh, and uh, I there I believe that there is a temporary place. They're cast into a place called Hades or Sheol, which is the dwelling of the dead, and that's where they wait. And, and if you're lost, it's horrible. But it will eventually end because hell itself is thrown into the lake of fire and it's destroyed. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that's what I think uh, the Bible says when you're when uh, a person is lost, they go there and you know, and, and, and that we are with the Lord when we perish. And this is clear that we are a triune being. Yeah. Just like God is Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, or Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we are, my, you know, the soul, spirit, and body. I mean, Paul makes it clear there. Yeah. Now, most of the audience probably has never even heard of this. It took me a lot of study and talking to people who believe that a lot of people who believe, as I do, that the lost perish and are destroyed, they also believe that in the intermediate state of existence, that the lost, uh, and even the saved, saved or lost, uh, until you get resurrected, uh, you're completely dead and you don't have a soul that uh, is uh, separate from your body. But Brother Jack Smack, I mean, doesn't this verse here uh, clearly show us that we are triune, body, soul, and spirit? Yeah, no, no, it refutes, I guess you were saying soul sleep or whatever. 
Well, that's a, that's a euphemism. They try to make it, uh, they use that term, but really, if they're going to be honest, they'll, they'll have to say they believe in complete death. I believe that if I died right now, my body died, but my mind, which is my soul, uh, is conscious and living apart from my body. But they believe that, no, you don't even have a soul. You only have a brain. And when your brain is is uh, dead and rots away, it's not functioning, that you don't have any conscious existence without a brain. But this says, no, we do have a body, soul, and spirit. Jack Smack, you probably, I remember. Yeah, yeah, I, I you, agree. I just think this verse is written to believers, though. I mean, I, I'm not saying you guys are saying otherwise. Yeah, yeah, but this verse is, is tell, could, I could tell the person who says, no, you don't have a, a soul that is apart from your physical body. I would say, well, no, we, we do have a body, a body, soul, and spirit. We got more verses to indicate that. Let's look next at Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So, Renee, as I said, there are people who think that your body and spirit, they don't deny that, but they deny that the soul. So this is telling us there is a distinction between soul and spirit. Soul and spirit are two different things, Renee. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that, because one goes to be with God who gave it, and the other one is all our experiences, our will, our mind, our memories. It's a completely separate thing and i don't believe in soul sleep i don't believe that we when we die that's it uh i believe that the soul departs from the body it is either present with the lord or it's kept in a holding place in sheol or hades it is not a place it's a it's a tormenting place but eventually even that place will be cast into the lake of fire and destroyed so uh, it uh, it's horrible, and pe we want people saved from it. Uh, mm -hmm. My thing is that as a God is love, and He is able to destroy His enemies. I don't think it's biblical to say that the torture goes on for all of eternity, but that the eternal fire is from an eternal source and will destroy, consume anything yeah. that's not of God. So, if anybody encounters someone that says that you do not have a soul distinct from your spirit. They're, they're, they're the same thing. You can point to these two verses here that clearly make a distinction between body, soul, and spirit. Um, Brother Jackson. If you deny the Trinity, and also it won't make sense. If you deny the Trinity, then you have to say, well, we're not a triune being either because yeah. we're made in his image. Jack Smack, have you encountered anybody yet that, that, that tells you that you, the soul and the spirit's the same thing? No, I haven't. I have. Yeah, but I've talked to a lot of people about this subject, uh, the soul sleep, and uh, that's that's what they believe. So I've had to use these verses to make them under, try to make them understand that the soul and spirit are not the same thing. Okay, now, so let's look further. The, the body and the soul are actually separate things. Let's look now at 2 Corinthians uh, 5. Um, it, now, uh, Renee, tell me your thoughts on this first. It says, for we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. By, by the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Uh, therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Uh, the important thing in this verse to me, Renee, is that we see Paul saying that when we die, we're absent from our body, but we are groaning, waiting for that resurrection. Right. So we are conscious Yep. We're aware we don't have a body. We crave having a body because 
a human being is created to have a body. We are a triune. We're supposed to have the body, soul, and spirit. Until we get the resurrected body, we groan for the bodily resurrection. That's what Paul's saying. That proves two things to me, that uh, uh, they are conscious mm -hmm. and that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the body... Uh, I mean, the, the, the soul is, is uh, definitely aware, even though it's uh, the body is dead. Mm -hmm. right? yep. It also confirms man's mortality without Jesus. Uh, we're mortal until Jesus gives us eternal life. So, mm -hmm. uh, but to, it is clear to me that there is consciousness. And uh, so he's asking, well, why is it that you're translating it that uh, if you're in heaven, that's forever and ever, but in hell, it's not. Okay, because we're not immortal. That's why you you only have immortality if God gives it to you. It says only God's immortal. We're not. No. Uh, no. So that's how it's working. I'm not saying uh, I don't want it to be forever. So I'm just saying that. I, I'm saying the scripture. There's like over fifty verses that say this, and there's only one or two verses that can even support eternal torment. And when you find out they're metaphoric idioms. It doesn't even, and then they define themselves through scripture. I, I personally can't believe it anymore. Like I, I, if you believe it, that's okay. Please don't get so upset that we're disagreeing with you. Uh, and also like Luke said, we all believe that there's consciousness after that. And we, I believe the loss go to this holding place and it is torments. It's, it's terrible, but it will eventually end is our point. Cause that, Death is swallowed up in victory. The lost and hell itself are thrown into the lake of fire. Well, the important thing about this portion of scriptures now is I'm presenting these scriptures so that if you're encountering someone that uh, say, say they agree with me that, that uh, there's no eternal torment, the lost perish and don't longer exist. But until the resurrection, you're not aware of anything. You don't have any conscious existence. Uh, these verses here show no. Uh, you you right. can kill you can kill the body and the soul exists. And this right. one points that out too. Matthew yeah. ten twenty eight again. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. So right. The, the soul sleep advocate says when your body dies, your soul dies because your no. soul is nothing more than your brain. No, they're trying to say that our only reason we have any consciousness is because of a physical organ, and that's yeah. not true. And you also know if you're absent from the body, like when Paul said, I, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Well, if you only have consciousness through the brain, why would he have thought he could have been out of his body? Yeah. He was obviously having perception and consciousness outside of his body. So it's clear that you can have consciousness outside the body. Yeah. So Jack Smack, uh, you, you, you see how these verses here uh, show us that, no, you do have a consciousness. You have an a, a actual awareness even after you die. Jack Smack? Hello? Jack Smack? Okay, hold on a second. I had to, I had to, re, I had to rearrange something. What was, what was your question? Okay, these verses here that we looked at in 2 Corinthians and also Matthew 10, 28, I'm trying to make the case that when a person dies, they're, they actually have a consciousness and a, an awareness even after death that they're not just in some kind of soul sleep or or that their soul also died and is waiting for the resurrection. But no, your body died, but your soul exists apart from your body. Yeah, I believe people will have a con consciousness when they're dead. I mean, you need your state. Yeah, well, these verses indicate that, but I'm trying to point this out for the people who encounter someone that says, no, 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 it's soul sleep, soul sleep. And soul sleep is a, is a euphemism, but it's a, what they really mean is that you don't have any awareness at all until you're resurrected. Now let's look at 1 Kings 17, 21 and 22. And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came into him again and he revived. Renee, does that, does that prove the case that your, your soul exists up outside of your body after death? Yeah, it came back to him. Yeah. It went somewhere. Yeah. Jack Smack? Yeah, it's just a, a 
pretty softly for it. You know? Yeah. And now look, let's look at Revelation 6, verses 9 and 10. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Renee, of course, this is happening in heaven. And uh, these souls, uh, these people are people who died. They're martyrs. And yet they're having this conversation. They seem to be conscious to me. Yeah, it's, it's clear to me that if you're saved, God gives you immortality. Your soul is conscious and it's groaning for to, uh, immortality to be replacing the mortality they had to be clothed with it. What did he call it? A tent? Yeah. To be clothed with a tent, with a body, with an immortal body so that we're like Jesus. So it's clear we have consciousness outside of the physical body. Yeah. His word about tent is like uh, our body is a dwelling place for our soul. And so you could call it like a, a dwelling place at that time was a tent. So your soul lives in your body or your, or it's like a tent. Um, okay, Jack Smack, do you think that revelations, uh, that, that would indicate then that uh, these people uh, died and yet they have some conscious existence in heaven? They are not unconscious or in soul sleep, are they? No. Uh -huh. Yeah. Now, now there's a, this problem. Uh, I, I believe that uh, when I die, I'm going to be with the Lord immediately. I'm not going to be unconscious waiting for the resurrection. And let's look at Philippians 1, verse 21 and 20 through 23. Uh, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I want not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Renee, how does this apply to this uh, argument for soul sleep? It, yeah, it, it's not scriptural. It's just there's so many verses that refute that nonsense. It's clear that you can be absent from your body and be conscious and aware in many many places and this is just another one yeah uh soul sleep is first of all uh it's uh, it's so easy to point out with scripture that you no know, people exist to have a conscious awareness after they die waiting for the resurrection and so the soul sleep is a very easy thing to refute but if you don't know how to refute it you could be confused by someone that, that's teaching that to you uh jack smack uh, does that does that persuasive to you that or should it be persuasive to people that, uh, you no, know, people are not unconscious after they die, waiting for a resurrection? Yeah, absolutely. I'm just wondering, I mean, if you know the answer, which group or, you know, based on denominationalism? Uh, that, would be, that would be, that would be Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh-day Adventists? Yeah, and, and, Jehovah's, okay. and Jehovah's Witnesses. They're the two groups. Well, but then there's people that they're not, they're not part of that denomination, and yet they're teaching this. A lot of times, the people who believe it, there's no eternal torment, uh, that people perish. I believe that. But I don't believe in soul sleep or unconscious state. But many people who, who reject eternal torment and believe in the lost perish, they also believe in soul sleep. So I want to make a distinction because I don't want people to think that because I leave, believe that the lost perish and no longer exist and are not being tortured forever, I don't want them to automatically assume that, oh, I must also believe in soul sleep. I don't. The scriptures clearly show there's no soul sleep. That's why I'm pointing yeah, this out. Okay, so let's look at uh, Rene. Uh, Philippians 1. Uh, no, I'm sorry. This is um, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Jack Smack, look that up, please. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Renee, what does that tell you? Yeah, it's clear that you can be away out of your body 
and still have consciousness. And the moment we leave this body, this mortal flesh, this corruptible flesh, <clears throat> we are present with the Lord, literally. And at the resurrection, he'll give us a glorified body to go with that reborn spirit. But it's clear we have consciousness once we leave this body. That's why I'm leaning towards even the lost are put into a place of torment. Maybe that parable of Lazarus and the rich man is a, a picture of that, you know, where people are temporarily held until that place is thrown into the lake of fire. So I believe in consciousness. You can't, you, you, you would have to deny so many scriptures to say that there is no consciousness outside of the body. Yeah. Okay. Jack Smack, when it says absent from the body and to be present with the Lord, uh, how does that, does, does that really refute uh, soul sleep? I mean, that you're not with the Lord immediately. You have to wait for the resurrection because uh, you're really, your soul's dead too. Yeah, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you how the soul sleep argument uh, is against this verse. They will say, yeah, absent from the body uh, and present with the Lord as far as you know. In other words, they say, you are, you, you die, and the next thing you know, you're with the Lord. You didn't, you're not even aware that a thousand years passed because you were unconscious. That's what they, how they explain that. Okay, now let's look at uh, Luke 16, verse 22 through 25. Renee, you were bringing this up. It says, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, he, being in torments and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tongue of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Okay, so Renee, uh, we can apply this towards uh, you know the uh, argument to, for eternal torment, but also... I want you to apply this to the idea of, wait a second, these, there seems to be an illustration of people conscious. Yeah, conscious, out of the body. Yeah. yeah. After they left their body, they're both conscious. Uh, but I, I believe this, I, I used to think it was a literal story, but it's in the middle of like seven parables. He's not going to give three parables and then a story that's not a parable and then three more parables. And he gives the, this parable in the context of that rich people are not automatically blessed by God or more righteous. And that if you want to be first in the kingdom, you should be last here on earth. Those will be first to be last and last will be first. So the point of the story wasn't really to say that people are tortured forever and ever in a place of fire. That that wasn't the point of the story. But uh, I believe that, uh, yeah, this is a clear indication that the lost and the saved will be conscious after death. Yeah. And I think the place where the rich man was held is the holding place called hell that at that time, Hades or Sheol, the dwelling of the dead, had two compartments, paradise and the place of torments. But uh, again, eventually the place of torments, hell, will be thrown into the lake of fire. We're just saying, we're not saying the lost aren't tormented. We're saying it doesn't last forever. That's all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jack Smack, what are your thoughts on that? Does, does that show that the, the illustrate to us that there is a conscious awareness for uh, souls after death? Yeah, it shows it. But what I also believe about this is that people do go to hell immediately when they die. I don't believe there's so some teaching out there that some Baptist preachers are saying that nobody's in hell mm -hmm. right now. I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is immediate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, now, this is one of the portions of scripture that pe people use to support that. Um, uh, I found that uh, th this is a, I agree with Renee that this is a parable, not a story. It's not a, an account of actual event. A parable is just something to teach you some, uh, some lesson, make a point. And this is actually a story that was told by rabbis even before Jesus, that Jesus was repeating. Uh, that's what I 
discovered from researching this. So I think that it's a parable and it's a story. And the purpose is really the main thing is to teach them that, hey, uh, the, uh, as Renee said, you don't go to heaven just because you're rich, because uh, being rich is, does not prove that you're righteous. They used to think that being right, uh, if you're rich, that proved that you're righteous because God's blessing you. Okay, let's go to Luke 23, verse 42 and 43. Uh, Renee it says, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Yeah, it's clear that the thief was about to die very soon. Jesus was about to die very soon. They would both be out of their bodies. But Jesus said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. And it's not like the seven day at Venice say, I tell you today, you'll be in paradise. He doesn't need to say, he's say I'm talking to you today. He knows he's talking to him today. So that's a terrible twisting of scripture. He's saying, today you'll be with me in paradise. So it's clear that he went to paradise, Abraham's bosom, that day. But he wasn't in his body. Yeah. It's clear. The, uh, the point you're making is, is referred to as the comma. If we read this, Verily, I say unto thee, comma, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. That's the way I understand it. But the people that believe in soul sleep, they can't deal with this verse uh, because Jesus is saying, wait, you're going to be with me in Paris today. Uh, right after you die, you don't have to wait for, you're not going to be unconscious for, uh, you know, waiting for a resurrection. You're going to be with me actually today. So what do they do? They move the comma and they say, uh, uh, verily I say unto thee today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. You see the difference? They're saying, I'm telling you this today. You will be with me in paradise. Yeah, but that's stupid because he didn't need to say, I'm telling you today. He knows he's telling them today. It I don't stupid, say, Luke, today I'm talking to you. That's, that's what they're forced to do to support the, the soul sleep idea. And that is a terrible uh, eisegesis. Okay, so Jack Smack, do you see by moving the comma how that changes the meaning there? Uh, I don't, I'm not aware of who does that. Do you some Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever? Yeah, the people who support soul sleep, they have Seven to. Seventh day Adventist and Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah, they have. Well, as I said, there are people I know who are not Seventh day Adventist and, and uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. They're baby, they're maybe they're Baptists or Methodists, whatever, but they, they believe in soul sleep. And if you do believe in soul sleep, what are you going to do with this verse? Jesus is saying, you're going to be with me today in paradise. So they have to move the comma to change the meaning. Um, yeah. okay. Let's go to next to 1 Peter 4, 6. Uh, For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Renee, why do you preach to the dead if they're unconscious? Renee? Yeah, uh, yeah. sorry, I couldn't get my mouse to click on it. Uh, yeah, it would be really silly to preach to people that are dead if they have no consciousness. Yeah. I mean, it's just silly. Yeah. You know, Jack Smack, I don't, I, you probably haven't encountered people uh, that have been arguing for soul sleep, but that if you ever encounter them, these are the verses that we use to show, look, why would Jesus go preach to the dead if they're unconscious, Brother Jack Smack? Well, I haven't, I haven't encountered any of people like that because I've only met one Seventh-day Adventist uh, member, and I, I was just trying to correct him on the gospel. He was right on that, and yeah. he didn't get deep enough into a theological conversation even. Yeah. Yeah. That he believes in this soul sleep nonsense, but yeah, yeah it's, it's clear that we're not there's no gap or there's no you know yeah. time frame where, where you're completely yeah. uncon in unconsciousness, we're in a state of nullity or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, I believe that once you die, you either go to heaven or hell immediately. And this yeah. soul sleep junk is, is, is oh, crap. Okay, <laughs> there's only a couple more verses here to point out this point, and we'll move on to the next uh, point here. It says First Peter 3 18 and 19 also says. Uh, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins for the just, uh, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, uh, bring, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. And then Matthew 17, 1 through 3 says, 
And after six days, Jesus, uh, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as a light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with them. Renee, I thought Moses and Elias were, after they died, they were unconscious. Uh, again, <laughs> I mean, there's just so many verses uh, proving that you're, even if you're out of your body, you're still conscious wherever you are. I mean, there's too many verses uh, proving that. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the point is made okay we so far we've talked about okay we showed verses that show that man is not uh born as an immortal that he has to gain immortality by faith in jesus we showed old testament and new testament verses that point out that god deals with the the, the wicked by destroying them and they perish he doesn't imprison them and torture them uh according to all those verses we went over and Renee, you said there's 50. There's a lot of verses that indicate that there's no indication of torture and imprisonment, just destruction. And so, you know, we're just going Bible, Bible, Bible. You know, what's the Bible say? Uh, now, this really started. When did, it, when did the first indication that you won't die come? The, the first lie. What was the first lie that was ever told? Satan told Eve, you will not surely die. And, and and now, uh, ever since then, we know that people have been teaching that, no, that man is immortal. He won't really die. Now, how did this start? Okay, the first indication of this, just a little of history, is that uh, uh, Plato and, and paganism influenced Christianity. Uh, Plato, uh, as the important leader in this thinking, the teaching of an everlasting place of punishment for the wicked is the natural consequence of a belief in an immortal soul. By the year 187 AD, it was understood that life, once we have it, is compulsory. There is no end to it, either now or in the world to come. We have no choice as to its continuance, even if we were to commit suicide to end it. That was uh, uh, the point that Plato made, and it was brought into the church. Ath Athenagoras in 130, uh, 133 to 190 AD, he was a Christian, but whose teachings were strongly tinged with Platonism, who had introduced the teaching of an immortal soul into Christianity. The idea of someone having an immortal soul wasn't part of Christianity until it was first introduced by Athenagoras. In this way, he paved the way for the logical introduction of eternal torment for immortal but sinful souls. And then we have Tertullian at 240 AD, he took up the teaching of an immortal soul. It, it was he who added the further but logical dimension. He taught the endless torment of the immortal soul of the wicked was parallel to the eternal blessedness of the saved. So Tertullian said, okay, we've adopted the idea that the soul is immortal. So if man exists forever, he's going to be either existing in bliss in heaven or in torment in hell forever. These were things that were brought into the church, but the scriptures didn't say it. And then 313, Con Constantine uh, and, and Licinius issued the Edict of Milan, which decriminalized Christianity. In Rome, Christianity was illegal until Constantine made it legal. And then in uh, 380 AD, uh, the... Uh, uh, the Edict of Cuncos Populos, also known as the Edict of Thessalonica, which declared that Trinitarian Christianity, as defined by the Nicene Creed, was the only legitimate religion of the Roman Empire. Well, why am I even bringing this up? Is because I want people to understand how gradually paganism and and uh, uh, Greek mythology and and uh, Plato and philosophy, all these things were brought into the church. And uh, the consequence was, well, the church d started believing that man has an immortal soul and that it's going to be tortured forever and ever. This is how it crept in. And then, of course, we have Augustine, uh, 
he is responsible for saying that man has no free will. That resulted in Calvinism. And he also made the idea of being tormented in hell popular. And then Dante wrote Dante's Inferno in the 14th century. And this is how people picture it. If you ever read Dante's Inferno, it's very graphic. And it's pretty much the way people understand hell now. It came from Dante's novel, The Inferno. So uh, let me just get your thoughts, uh, Renee, first on the history of how this was gradually brought in. in the Man, first I've been wanting you to get to this because I wanted to tell them up front. Hey, I we studied this a long time. This immortal soul and eternal torture was not believed by any of the apostles, any of the prophets, none of the Jews, none of the first century church. None of them believed, I'm just letting you know, it doesn't mean they're right, right? We don't go by what others believe, but what scripture says only. However, you got to look at that. If the people who wrote the Bible didn't believe in eternal conscious torment, but believe that there's a holding place, it looks like, for a period of time until the judgment and then that place of torment and the people are thrown into the lake of fire and death is swallowed up in victory. It is destroyed. There is no more death. And the there's 50 over probably a hundred verses that are clear that it's the second death. They're perished. They're destroyed. Everlasting destruction. Fear the one that can destroy both body and soul in hell. They shall perish. They shall never perish. It's clear if, if you never had this tradition in your mind and were never told that you're immortal, you'd come to this conclusion. But we've had tradition tell us that that's the truth. And we're almost scared that it's heresy or for some reason, there's no reason to preach the gospel if there's no uh, eternal torment. But you will be tormented and there'll be varying degrees of punishment, I believe. And you'll be destroyed in the lake of fire and you missed out on being with Jesus and you missed out on eternal life. It's all horrible. But I think this rectifies God's loving nature and his justice. This makes more sense. How can you tell an atheist God is love and he's merciful? But if you don't believe him, he's going to torture you forever. What's going to happen? Is he going to keep giving you a body so that you can continue to be uh, tortured forever? He's just going to give you because see the dead that are lost, they're raised up into a body yeah. and they are cast. It says that the ones that worship the beast, they are cast alive into the lake of fire. Is the body not destroyed? It's a mortal body. It's destroyed. So if you hadn't been taught this tradition, there's no evidence of any of them believing that until the like he said paganism came in plato's idea of the immortal soul which augustine adopted the pagan ideas like dante's inferno of places where you're tortured forever unless you're worshiped as a god then you're not that's crazy and uh all of these ideas came into the christian church they were never the foundational truths and once i saw it and then the, the two verses maybe that you can use for eternal conscious torment. Some of them aren't even talking about humans. They're talking about Satan. Yeah, but we're the we're, have, we can explain through idioms and metaphoric language. Yeah, we're getting very close to that point in the conversation to go over that. But let me ask Jack Smack here. Let me, here's a little paragraph that I wrote. I would like for your, your thoughts on, brother. It says, the concept of eternal torment seems to convert the true God of justice into a cosmic sadist the cosmic the, the concept of eternal torment seems to run contrary to biblical examples god destroyed sodom and gomorrah with fire suddenly and quickly he destroyed noah's evil world with water suddenly and quickly he ordered the canaanites to be killed swiftly in the law of moses there was no provision for incarceration or torture punishments for, viol uh, for violation of the law consisted either of restitution or death. Even sacrificial animals were spared suffering through precise prescriptions for their killing that guaranteed a death that would be as quick and painless as possible. 
I don't think that the, the uh, teaching of eternal torment conforms to the character of the God of the Bible. Brother Jack Smack, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, if you look at justice, I mean, the, the idea of somebody just getting annihilated is not, not fair either. I mean, it's not right either. I mean, that's not a proper punishment for somebody. I mean, just they die and it's painless. That's my opinion, though. That has nothing to do with, I guess, what we're talking about. That's yeah, but we can't, we can't, we can't deny that in, in the Bible, the the laws of Moses prescribed uh, death by stoning. So God gave an order of death. Uh, so yeah. God does does prescribe the death penalty, but there's nothing in Mosaic law where God prescribes torture and incarceration. Renee, what's your thoughts on that? What was the question? I'm sorry, I was answering a viewer. I said in the in the old in the uh, mosaic laws mm -hmm. God does prescribe death by stoning uh, yeah. and what we call capital punishment. Uh -huh. but God does never prescribe in the mosaic law uh, imprisonment and torture, does he? No, he doesn't. And and again, this this whole doctrine falls apart because man's not immortal. Period. Yeah. We're not immortal. You can't be tortured forever if you don't live forever. Okay. Now, everybody's, everybody's waiting for us to get to the verses that they want to use to support eternal torment. Okay. We're, all, we're almost there. All right. First, let me do this. Let me say that let's look at the Apostle John. Now, it, Apostle John wrote the Gospel of John and other things, but in the in the Gospel of John, uh, it says he wrote that book with the intention of telling us how to be saved. That's the point of the book. And yet, there is no reference to hell in the Gospel of John. There is, there is only a reference to life or perishing. You'll either perish or you'll have life. What about the Apostle Paul? There is not one reference to hell by the Apostle Paul. Now, this is what Paul does say. Uh, well, first, let's look at the book of Acts. It says, wherefore, this is Acts 20, 26. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. So Paul says, I've given you the whole counsel. There's nothing that's important for you to understand that I've left out. Paul covered all the bases. And yet, what does Paul say about eternal torment? Nothing. All he says, in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So Paul's telling us there's either death or eternal life. Romans 9.22, Paul says, What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction? So Paul says there's wrath and there's destruction, but he's not talking about eternal torment. Uh, and in Philippians 3.19 Paul says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. Uh, and then finally, in uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9, Paul writes, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction, from the presence of the Lord and from the God, glory of his power, everlasting destruction. So that brings us to the idea of um, the everlasting destruction, um, e eternal, the word eternal. There's, a, there's an idea of something continuing forever, which is, uh, let's call it the difference between eternal punishment and eternal punishing. There's a difference. Eternal punishment means the punishment has eternal consequences. It cannot be undone and reversed. Eternal punishing means the punishing continues on and on and on. Continually, you're being punished. So that's the important thing to understand that uh, this idea of eternal uh, everlasting destruction means the destruction has an eternal consequence. Um, all right, let me stop there. So. Paul, Peter, J John, uh, 
if Paul was the greatest apostle, why did he leave out hell, eternal torment? Why did John write the gospel, how to get saved, and leave out eternal torment? Uh, Brother Jack Smack? Well, it depends on how you look at it. I mean, in John 3.36, it seems like he is teaching eternal torment. It says the wrath of God abideth on, on, on him. And the, the word abide means it, it just continues on. It continues on. It doesn't stop. I mean, it just depends on how you look at it. Paul is preaching mainly to believers anyway. He's not going to put a lot of emphasis on hell when believers can't go there. I mean, yeah, there are a few warnings in Philippians and in, um, even in, I think, Colossians. There's warnings about hell, but he's like telling us that we need to warn others. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about eternal hell, eternal torment. I don't know, once again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Renee, I mean, what, what, do, you, what do you conclude if, uh, if John and Paul and, and uh, their it seems to me if uh, the idea of eternal torment was uh, uh, was true and also important for us to understand and agree uh, that they would be emphasizing it. I mean, why do we find why do we find John saying you'll either perish or have life, and and Paul talk about you'll be destroyed and have a death and destruction, but never mention eternal torment. Everywhere I look, even Jesus Himself, any time any of the prophets are discussing the ultimate destination of the lost and the wicked every single time they talk about how they'll be destroyed how they'll perish how they'll suffer the second death it does not say they'll be tortured for all of eternity or torment alive and conscious immortal but they're not immortal so it can't even happen anyway but there's no place that says uh, we've already established we're not immortal. I, I don't even know why we're continuing to discuss whether it's eternal torment. If we're not immortal, we can't be tortured forever because we don't live forever. But in any case, uh, there's no place where any of the apostles say anything other than destruction, destroy. Uh, do you know where they're getting these doctrines? Is from the book of Revelation, which is actually a vision what John has and uses a lot of colorful language, which we're going to discuss in a few minutes, but there's no reason for them to, to talk about it because it doesn't exist. I don't see it anywhere in scripture except two places that could be twisted to say that. And it's always the same two verses, but it, it, they always say they're destroyed. The wicked are destroyed. And uh, when Jack Smack was saying, you know, the wrath that God abides on them, that just means they're never reconciled to God. They're never reconciled to God. The mm -hmm. wrath of God abides on them because they didn't believe. So they were never reconciled. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I made the point that the God of the Bible is a God of love, mercy, and justice. It, it would seem to anybody, I think, who did not already have an established opinion that they, they're holding on to, it would seem to me that uh, being tortured forever and ever and ever would not be justice. It would be overkill. It would be way, way more than, than would be deserved for any kind of punishment. Uh, so uh, I just don't see how the God of the Bible is going to torture people at all. I don't think God will torture them at all, much less forever and ever and ever. I can't imagine Jesus. The Jesus I know and love and the way I understand Jesus, I can't see him putting a blowtorch to someone for one minute, much less torturing them with fire forever and ever and ever. It doesn't match the character and nature of our God. That's one of my biggest uh, problems with the idea. Of course, we also went over how many scriptures so far, 50, 60, 70 scriptures that, that indicate otherwise. Um, all right, let me mention another problem here that I think is one of the most important things for a person to, to wrestle with. If, if you want to hold on to eternal torment, then I ask you about propitiation. The word propitiation appears only a couple of times in the Bible, and it means that the, the payment for sin was paid in full. There's nothing else owed. Jesus says it is finished. Um, debt is paid, paid in full, no, no more, nothing else is required. Jesus suffered and died on the cross, and that was all that's required, okay? Well, if, if someone is going to say that the, the consequence for someone's sin is eternal torment, 
then how can they also say that Jesus paid the full price for sin because he it is he died he suffered and died on the cross but if eternal torment is the is the price to pay Jesus would have to be eternally tormented in our place as far as I know Jesus is sitting in the right hand of the Father and not being tortured right now so if if eternal torment is required to pay for sins he's dead he didn't pay it all wages of sin is death and he took on death for all men i like your point there luke yeah i, I just don't think death, a person can, can have you cannot have the concept of propitiation the sin debt was paid in full on the cross and also have the concept of uh eternal torment for the lost they contradict each other brother jack smack how can you reconcile that Torment does not make God look good, right? Yeah. Well, it doesn't. But it doesn't. But see, it's man. It makes man look bad. And that's why. That's one really reason I believe they go there eternally is because they they choose to. Well, that's beside the point. But the point about propitiation is he paid for the sins of the whole world, not just the believers. He paid for all people's sin. What that tells me is that they're paid for it, but if they don't accept the propitiation. It's not going to count for them. They don't automatically get out of hell free because he's pro the propitiation for all their sins. The Calvinists would say that. It's double jeopardy. He paid for our sins, and we got to pay for it too. It doesn't apply if you don't if you don't ever receive it. It's still made. The propitiation was still made. The payment was still made, but it doesn't apply until you receive it by faith. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that has anything to do with what you're saying. Yeah, but okay, okay. It it applies to me, doesn't it? And to you, we received it, right? Yeah, because we accepted it. Yeah. yeah okay. Accepted. So, but but then if, if if Jesus paid for my sins on the cross. I can't argue that the payment for sins is eternal torment because he did. He's not being eternally tormented for me, is he? Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's let's go on. To the next point is. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, the word Gehenna uh, is only spoken by Jesus in the Bible. It's mentioned thirteen times in eleven verses. And Jesus only says it when he's either in Jerusalem or near Jerusalem, and he's only saying it when he's speaking to Jews. So the question is, what is Gehenna? Because it's always translated as hell. But but Gehenna, what is Gehenna actually? It's a small valley in Jerusalem. Uh, it, Gehenna was initially where some of the kings of Judah sacrificed their children by fire. Thereafter, it was deemed to be cursed. Uh, so uh, in rabbinic literature uh, and Christian and Islamic scriptures, Gehenna is a destination of the wicked. But that's not what Gehenna was originally. When Jesus' time, the, the reference was it was a place where not only, uh, as it says here, the, uh, the kings of Judah sacrificed their children, but it was also a dump where they burned the trash and uh, threw all the dead bodies and put them in the fire. And so... That's all it really was. It was a place where trash and, uh, you know, criminals and stuff, the dead people, they'd be thrown into this fire. That's what Gehenna really is, and yet it's translated as hell every time in the Bible. Renee, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, there's several words translated as hell. One's Gehenna, one's Tartarus, and run is Hades. Hades isn't good or bad. It's just the dwelling of the dead where there's good and bad. Then there's, you know, Gehenna, the fire pit outside of Jerusalem. The dead were thrown there, and that's where the bodies were burned up. So if Jesus said you'll be thrown into Gehenna, which is what's translated hell, everybody knew what that meant, that you'd be destroyed, just like the, the dead bodies were destroyed there. And again, I want to say, because of what's in the uh, chat room, I will never tell you, hey, just trust what God told me on this, because I'm nobody. Trust what scripture says, go to God, ask him about it. You know, this is just what we have come to based on our study in scripture. And we don't all agree on everything on this at all. And I don't even bring this up on my channel because it causes so much division and emotionalism. Yeah. So it's unfortunate that we can't open-mindedly set aside tradition to even study a subject. And when we do learn something, openly share it with people and say, hey, look, I'm leaning this way. I think this might mean this. Because if you're not 100% sure on it, you're going to be attacked. And you got to know you're 100% sure to be 
you know, uh, uh, accept all the hate that comes. Yeah, and it's so sure. unfortunate I'm seeing this. You know, I'm, I'm, I believe you are apologizing too much about this. We don't need to apologize to anybody. What we, what I said in the very beginning is, what does the Bible say? Whatever the Bible says, I'm going to believe it. Yeah, and everything we're saying is scripture. It's not like we're pulling this out of nowhere. We, we, we showed scriptures about uh, the man being mortal unless he receives immortality from Jesus. He's not immortal. That's the Jesus. Old Testament and the New Testament that describe God's attitude to the wicked, that they're going to be destroyed and perish. Uh, we showed uh, all these scriptures. Uh, uh, it's been scripture, scripture, scripture. So a person can either consider the scriptures as I've done and come to a conclusion. That's all. all you yeah, can do. I don't insist anybody agree with us either. Like I, I have no motive to make somebody agree with me on this. I just want a good defense of why I believe this way now. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to stand, say why I'm on this position. Okay, and so uh, let, me, let me make one more point here and get your thoughts on this. I talked about how the, the, the concept of the difference between eternal punishment and eternal punishing. It's important to make this distinction Eternal punishment means that you punish someone and it can never be undone. It has, it's eternal, it can't be yep. changed. Eternal punishing means that you're punishing them ongoing, ongoing forever and ever. Oh, right, that's a, bit a different word. Okay, so if, we, if we're going to in, interpret the, the idea of uh, e eternal uh, torment as to be uh, an eternal fire, all these things to be, that the, it goes on and on forever, then we need to also consider this. The Bible also speaks of eternal judgment. Hebrews 6, uh, 2, it says, is, is a judgment that continues eternally or is it a judgment with eternal consequences? So I, I don't have that in front of me here, but in Hebrews 6, 2, it refers to eternal judgment. And does that mean God's going to continue judging us forever and ever and ever? The judging never stops? Or does it mean the judgment God makes is, is can't ever be changed for all eternity. Then, and also uh, eternal redemption is, is in Hebrews 9, 12. Now, does that mean that we are redeemed ongoing and ongoing, it continues to more redemption, more redemption, or does he redeem us and it's done and it's finished, it can never be undone? That's the way we need to understand this. Uh, Renee, what are your, your thoughts on that? I, I'm a little upset right now. I, I, need, to, I need to chill out because people just can't, they, they can't just have an open mind and there's nothing destructive about telling somebody that there is a uh, torment. You will face ju uh, judgment and it's terrible, but God won't continue to torture you for all eternity because I don't care what you say. People are ashamed of that. Yeah. People that say he's a loving God, he's merciful, but it'll torture you. It does not even work. And the Bible doesn't support it. You can take those two verses and he's going to explain the smoke of the torment the, yeah. the Bible we're, interprets itself. We're going to get to a couple of verses that all eternal torment hangs their hat on a couple of verses. We're going That's to go right. to next, but, but I'm just too uh, look, at all, look at all the verses we, look at all the verses we, we found to support man's soul is mortal unless we, yes, we, it is. The Bible says so. Yeah. What, like they won't look at it. They won't look at it. We're just wrong. And oh, we're not oh. insisting people even agree with us. That's what I don't understand. Why can't we be allowed to think for ourselves and say, this is the conclusion I came to. This is why. Take it or leave it. You don't have to leave it. I don't, but think, don't, to I, I don't think you should. I don't think you should have your feelings hurt by, by that. Whatever they want, someone else wants to think, that's fine. They can they can reject all this if they want. All I'm not trying to push it. That's the whole Point. Yeah, but for okay. someone to say I'm endangering the body of Christ, who I love so much, I don't understand how it's a danger to say that the torment doesn't go on for all of eternity. I don't understand that. Okay, uh, Jack Smack, could you look up this verse for me? Because I don't have it in front of me. It says Revelation 14 9 through 11, and you can read that to me when you find it. But uh, um, my notes here say. Uh, this verse is, is to demonstrate that the suffering of the wicked will be eternal. They most often highlight two phrases. The first refers to those who take the mark of the beast during the tribulation, 
who will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels. The second is that the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Uh, notice that the passage did not speak of eternal torment, rather it speaks of the smoke of their torment ascending forever. The Bible is its own best interpreter. When you look up statements similar to this, you will find that they are symbolic for punishment that has eternal consequences, not a punishment that continues eternally. For example, consider Isaiah 34.10, which speaks of the destruction of Edom. It is the smoke of Edom's destruction will go up forever. Now, uh, the smoke's not going up in Edom still today, is it? Edom's so, not burning anymore because they were saying in the chat room, it's our bodies that feed it the fire so that the smoke continues to burn. That just sounds gross. But the Old Testament uh, defines itself like you just proved. The smoke of their torment rises forever. Is the city still burning? No, but he says the smoke rises forever. Yeah. And then also in Jude uh, 7, verse 7, is talking about Sodom and Gomorrah experienced the punishment of eternal fire. But is that fire going on today? In Sodom and Gomorrah? Fire's not continuing. The smoke's still not ascending. But the consequence of what happened there their punishment is eternal punishment, and the consequences can never be reversed and undone. Uh, Jack Smack, do you have those verses I asked you? Yeah, they're right here. You want, would you read them, please? Verse 8? Verse uh, 9 through 11, Revelation 14, okay. 9 through 11. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God without, okay, excuse me, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, excuse me, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the, of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Okay, so the, the significant thing is says the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever, but it also says that the smoke of, of uh, Edom will go up uh, is go up forever, and it says the fire of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah is eternal fire. So the point that I'm making here is that these things are not talking about the fire continuing forever. It's talking about the consequence of this destruction uh, lasting forever. It's never going to be undone. Uh, Jack Smack, do you have anything to say about that? Well, the whole idea of eternal torment comes from the, the middle of the verse where it says they have no rest day nor night. I mean, it's talking about the people have no rest day nor night. It doesn't necessarily support it's eternal, but I mean, they don't have, they, they're not annihilated right away if they have a, they have a, you know, a problem with no rest yeah. day or night. Now, there, right. there, 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 there are people uh, who believe that, uh, uh, there's not eternal torment for the lost as a whole, but for that particular group, there is. And then there's people that believe, well, there's also, there's not eternal torment for the lost as a whole, but for the beast and the false prophet and, and uh, the, the or whatever, that, that for them, it is. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but... The demons will not be going to answer. They're, they're reserved in darkness forever. It's my demons. Yeah, well, I mean, Renee, Renee pointed out a verse to me that we'll cover in the very, very end of this that addresses the, the, the angels. So we'll get to that when we're finished with this. Um, Renee, uh, what do you have to say about that point, about the smoke uh, rising forever and ever? This is what I've been trying to get to the entire time. Because when you show what this verse means, based on the bible interpreting itself again the bible is not open for private interpretation the bible interprets itself so to see all the discussion on well doesn't the body it's the bodies that are eternally being tortured that makes the smoke keep going no the bible is using an idiom here it is a figure of speech and how do we understand it we go back to the Bible so it interprets itself. And then Luke did exactly that by going to the Old Testament, talking about a city or a nation that God had destroyed, that had destroyed a physical kingdom here on this earth that had been destroyed or is going to be destroyed. And it says the smoke of their torment rises forever, just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, is Sodom and Gomorrah still burning? 
No, it's not. It just means it's permanent. There shall be no more life there ever again. It is utterly destroyed. It is an eternal judgment from the eternal God. And it will never live. It will never be again. And so when we let the Bible interpret itself and not our own thinking, like to try to apply literal things like that, when you've got over 50 verses telling you that it's destruction, it's perishing, it's destroyed, that hell itself is thrown into the lake of fire and destroyed, then, uh, and then you see 50 more verses about how God always deals with his enemies. They're utterly consumed. They're utterly destroyed. They perish. They suffer eternal punishment. That punishment is permanent. They can. They will never uh, uh, be reconciled. So I'm so glad because this one verse is what makes people believe this, that man's immortal and they're going to keep feeding the fire with their body continually regenerating and being burned and regenerating and being burned. And it just, it's, I, I don't think it's scriptural, especially when you can see that the smoke of their torment is used as a metaphor over in the Old Testament for God's destruction of a city. So I'm so glad that that was addressed because that is the big one uh, that people use. And the New Testament uses a lot of Old Testament language and you will not understand it unless you study the Old Testament and you'll come up with stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, there's another one here that says, didn't Jesus teach eternal torment when he said that hell is a place, quote, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, Mark 9, 48. Another idiom. Yeah. So uh, the answer, Jesus could not have been teaching eternal torment when he made this statement because he is quoting Isaiah 66, 24, which says that the redeemed will be able to view the corpses of those who are lost. Uh, the phraseology about the worm and the fire is figurative language that emphasizes the fact that the testimony of what happens to lost will never die. They will die. When it says the worm dieth not, it means they will not be resurrected to immortal life, to eternal life. If the worm dieth not, it means that they remain dead. They are not resurrected into eternal life. It's as clear as that. And that view, that same idiom is used in the Old Testament several times. Mm -hmm. That's explained now, also. Th this is an important thing to understand, too. It says... The, the fact is that the testimony of what happens to the lost will never die. In other words, the, the idea that uh, uh, the statement about the destruction will go on forever and ever. We'll always have that, that understanding. It's, uh, it's not that their, their uh, torture and torment goes on forever. It's our understanding of what happened to them. Uh, it says similar wording is used about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Jude 7 tells us that these cities experienced the punishment of eternal fire. That does not mean an eternally burning fire. Rather, it speaks of a fire with eternal consequences. Um, all right. Now, there's also a point here in the uh, talking about the mark of the beast. Uh, we, do, oh, we already talked about that. Okay. Let's talk about the Antichrist and the false prophet. Uh, Jack Smack, uh, Revelation 19.20 and 20 verse 10 can you find those for us um revelation 19 20 19 19 20 and 20 verse 10. Uh, this is what the commentary on it is it says yes revelation 20 10 states that the antichrist and his false prophet will be tormented forever and ever together with satan but this certainly is no indication that the rest of humanity will suffer eternal torment but it may be well may well be that the Revelation 20:10 is not speaking of the human beings who will serve as the Antichrist and false prophet. It may instead be speaking of the demonic spirits that possess them. Note that the passage refers to the beast and the false prophet. We are told in Revelation 11:7 that the beast comes up out of the abyss. According to the scriptures, this is the pit where evil spirits are imprisoned, not human beings. Likewise, the false prophet is referred to as another beast, meaning another of the same kind. Uh, okay, could you read those, those verses for us? But the, the idea is that, uh, as I said, there are some people that conclude uh, as a whole, 
the lost are not going to suffer eternal torment, but there are the people who take the mark of the beast and there are the, the false prophet and, and the beast that they do suffer eternal torment. I mean, wait, that, isn't that, I got a question on that. Isn't forever and ever translated from eon there also as in a indefinite but finite a period of time? Well, that's another answer to it. So what did you elaborate on that? And that's something we haven't covered yet. Okay. Uh, the words forever and ever are translated from the Greek word eon, which does have uh, a finite but unspecified amount of time. So when it says forever and ever is translated from eon, it, it, it could it could imply a finite amount of time. But this is not talking about human beings anyway. It's just talking about Satan and the false prophet. So it's possible they are, but I, I even believe they're ultimately destroyed based on some other Old Testament scripture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jack Smack, can you read those for us? And the beast is taken with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had deceived the mark of the beast, then that worshiped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And then jump ahead to verse 10 of the next chapter. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there are people who uh, reject eternal torment, but they don't know how to get around the, this idea of this last, that last verse she read. So they c would conclude that that individual, those couple of individuals, they will be suffering, but humanity as a whole who never believed in Jesus will not suffer eternal torment because the scriptures don't, don't state that at all. Um, okay, we're getting very near the, the end here. So uh, let me bring this up uh, because Renee brought this up to me uh, yesterday or the day before, and I've never noticed this before. But uh, Jack Smack, you, you talked about the, the demons that continue to be punished. So uh, this is new to me. Let me get everybody's thoughts on this. Psalm 82 starting with verse one, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. How long will ye judge justly and accept the persons of the wicked, Selah? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men and fall like the one of the princes. So, Renee, you want to elaborate particularly on verse 6, saying, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men. Yeah, this is in the Old Testament where I believe it's after uh, he he has these watchers that are talked about in Daniel that uh, look like principalities. They are rulers over nations. And I believe that after uh, uh, Babel, the Tower of Babel, when he separated them into like 70 nations, he gave a bunch of angels rule over these, gen these, these nations and he carved out Israel as an inheritance to himself. So that would be the holy nation set apart. Now, these angels were not judging justly. They weren't insisting that the, the, the human rulers uh, be just, to be good to the poor and to the widow. And they were just really unjust, corrupt people. And so because of their, God puts a judgment on these spirit beings who would otherwise be immortal. They are eternal. It tells us that. That they were, you know, so uh, he puts a judgment on them and says, but you shall die like men. You shall fall as one of the princes. So and there's another thing I forgot to show you, Luke, where it talks about when I believe it's the king of Tyre or something, which is like a um, another name used for Satan. And it says how he will be ashes under the feet and be a horror to many. Like he used to be so powerful, but he's going to end up being ashes. People are going to be like, this is the thing that shook the whole world, you know. But then you see in the Old Testament, it says that he, he's going to be destroyed. So I don't know if that's 
Satan personally, or if it's just another spirit being with great power in the kingdom of darkness. But when I found these verses, it's interesting because it even puts the curse of mortality on an eternal being, an angel. That's why I said, you're sons of God. You are, um, um, but you will die like men. They're not men. Otherwise, they wouldn't say you shall die like men. And these were, that's why I called them little G gods, because they were the Elohim. They were the spirit beings that had principalities over these um, areas, just like it talks about the prince of Persia. That would have been one of these entities that God has put judgment on to say they're going to die like men. So um, they don't have physical bodies in this dimension like us. So the only way to die like men would be they'd be thrown in the lake of fire and destroyed. And I think the angels that kept not their first estate, they're being kept in chains. Then we see they're going to be released to uh, torment those that take the mark of the beast during this terrible time at the end. And then their judgment will come. So I think he's just holding them there in chains until they can be used for God's purpose. And then their judgment comes because it says held until the day of the judgment of that great day. So mm -hmm. they're going to face their judgment, but they're being contained right now. So they can't do any more damage. And then they're going to be let loose for a little while to serve God's purpose. That's what those verses uh, seem to mean. Okay. Uh, Jack Smack, what, what, what do you think of the, the verse and the, her explanation of that? How is that? I mean, it says the children of, of, of the Most High. I mean, I guess that's referring to angels, but I don't think it's referring to the fallen angels yet, necessarily. But I don't think that they will die like men. I mean, fallen angels are pure evil. That's why I believe that hell does go on forever. It's rightly so, because when a person dies, they're, they're no longer, they have no more humanity left in them. It's like there's nothing but evil left in them. Same with the fallen angels. They're just pure evil, and that's where they should be forever. I mean, yeah, but, let, what well, asking, but. Well, let, let me ask you. Um, this is a new that's point. possible too. I'm not. I'm not saying I'm absolutely right. Well, this is a new point that she's made that I haven't thought much about until now. But you just said that these angels, uh, they well, if they're not fallen angels, they can't be the unfallen angels that die like men, can they? It, ha I mean, it can't I'm be talked about. It doesn't say. Maybe, maybe this, these angels fell later. I don't know. They weren't originally. I don't think it's talking about the, what demons Yeah. Originally. Well, see, here's the thing to me. We're at the point now where we're going to kind of sum up our thoughts and, and, and rehash everything and, uh, and lay out exactly how we see it based upon every, all our studies. But uh, I really don't care about the false prophet and the beast. And, and I don't care. Uh, about the the mark of the beast and all, all that that group of people. What I'm what I care about are people right here and now who are um, um, lost, and and I want to be able to tell them what the Bible says is the uh, the possibles for their eternity. On one hand, it's possible for them to receive eternal life as a free gift. On the other hand. They could reject that, and then they'll perish and be destroyed because they don't have immortality. Uh, that's what I want people to understand. But if, if we tell them that the God of the Bible, uh, if you do not uh, it, it, it believe in him and receive this gift, that he is going to torture you with fire forever and ever, if the Bible said that, if all these verses we are going over here tonight said that, I'd have to say it because I believe the Bible's true. But I think we pointed out, we covered 50, 60, 70 verses that don't support it. And a couple of verses at the end here that we tried to explain that people used to support it. And if we just look at sheer numbers, it's like 95% don't support it. And only a few do. And so, but if the Bible did, say it, I believe it, because that's what I thought the Bible believed for 20, uh, taught for 25 years. I, I taught it, I defended it for 25 years until a friend of mine, who is really more of a novice, I led him to the Lord and he started studying 
and then and then eventually he starts teaching this telling me about this no there's no eternal torment they perish and he brought it into my home bible study and everybody was all upset because he's saying something so crazy but i listened to him for two years and we argued about this before i finally realized that wait a second the bible there's only a couple of verses that support eternal torment and there's all this stuff we showed you tonight that disputes it so i had to go with what the scripture said and i changed my mind but i believe that the concept of a god that will torture people with fire forever and ever if they reject him does not help with evangelism and it's not true that's the most important thing but it doesn't help with evangelism i think it's a barrier to evangelism and i think the concept of eternal torment which was introduced in the early church history that was not there in the beginning not taught by the apostles but I believe that teaching has caused done more to hamper Christianity than it ever helped. I know a lot of people that have rejected Christianity for that reason alone. They can never accept that I could never believe in a God that's going to torture people with fire forever and ever because they refuse to believe in him. Uh, so I, I, there are some people that told me that they got saved because they were afraid of being tortured in hell. But far more people have told me that that's been a barrier. They could never accept that God of the Bible for that very reason. So I don't think it helps. But if it was true, I'd preach it. I did for 25 years because I thought it was true. But uh, uh, I don't believe it's true anymore. And, and I believe it doesn't help evangelism. It hampers it. Uh, so uh, let me give everybody a chance. We're going to just kind of like freely talk about generally our conclusions now. Jack Smack, what do you, what do you have to say about my point, Aaron, and, and anything else? Well, when I got saved, I knew I believed it was eternal, and I had a dream about it. It wasn't telling me I was going to be annihilated, and I w I woke up in the middle of the night, scared to death. And the next day, I got saved. I mean, I had to be saved the very next day, and. I don't think the, the, the concept of, uh, of God being like a rapist or some type of an oppressive mafia king where he's going to torture you is the right uh, is the right way to describe it. You should tell people they're a criminal and they deserve the death penalty. It's kind of like tell, taking a serial killer and saying that this, this police officer is going to torture you in prison forever. No, he's a, you're a serial killer, you're a murderer, you, you're a criminal, and you're going to do your just time. You're going to do what you, what you deserve. That's a better way to approach it in terms of evangelism. But yeah, I will say the idea of eternal punishment is, is overkill, and it would turn people away. But in my view, and I don't know if we're going to get to that yet, in my view, people would never want to get out of hell. So that's a different story. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Okay. Yeah, we want to know your view and elaborate on that. But let me ask Renee, just respond to what, what my point there, that I, I believe that it doesn't help with evangelism. Uh, in rare cases, people might get scared into, into believing and trust in Jesus. But more times than not, I think it hampers it because they reject that uh, I can never believe in that kind of a God. How many times that's, have you heard that, Renee? That's what I've seen every atheist I've talked to, Luke. Every atheist I talk to, you want to tell me how good God is, but if I don't believe him, if I don't get convinced, he's going to just torment forever and ever. He said, I can't, my atheist friend said, I can't, I couldn't let somebody watch somebody or know somebody is being burned for, for, a minute 30 seconds but you're telling me god's love and he's going to do it for all of eternity and i i looked at that i go you know what it is hard to say but i used to go well he offers he does love us he sent his son he offers eternal life but then it hit me we're not even immortal so it's not a matter of of uh whether we want eternal torment not to be true or not it's what does the bible say we're not immortal and and if you're not immortal, you're destroyed. You don't have life. You're not immortal, so you're destroyed. I mean, unless God all of a sudden grants you immortality just so you can continue to be burned over and over again for all eternity. But I believe death is swallowed up in victory. I, I don't believe that, that the Bible supports eternal torment. I think it says that they are kept in a place of torment until the judgment day and so it is a terrible thing with flames and it is a literal place 
I'm just, I'm not denying that. I'm just saying it doesn't go on for all eternity. That you're not suffering for all eternity. It does have an end. Okay. And I think well, if people really studied this and let scripture, because what we're being accused of is our opinion, but all we've done is give like 70 scriptures tonight. Yeah. We, uh, have, a reason. we have a reason, a good biblical reason for this conclusion. And I, and again, we're not trying to, force people into believing this way. We're just standing in defense of what we believe it is saying, you know, and why we believe this, but also Luke, the fact that, that, that it is something we're ashamed of. Sometimes the churches don't like being asked pastors don't like being asked. Oh, he's love. But if I don't believe in him, he's going to torture me forever or allow or allow the torment, whether it's God doing it or not. Just to allow a sentient being to be in that much pain for a finite amount of crime for all eternity. Now, that would make sense if we had immortal souls because they would have no choice. We rejected him. So we got to go to the place. Right. That's not with it. But we're mm -hmm. not immortal so that it doesn't make sense. OK, so uh, let's each take a, a, a turn now at summarizing what we actually conclude. Uh, I'll, I'll go first, and um, as I said, I believed what we would call the traditional viewpoint, the majority viewpoint uh, in, in the church, uh, at least in the church in America, um, that uh, um, the lost are tormented or tortured forever and ever. I believed it and taught it and defended it, but once I... But that's because I just accepted what I was told. I didn't really study the issue. But when I was challenged on that by my friend and I decided, well, I'm going to prove him wrong. And I started looking at the Bible myself to see what does it actually say about this. I found three, three or four verses that we use to support eternal torment. And then I found all these verses that say man is not even immortal. We, we're not immortal. We don't live forever. Our souls don't go on living forever unless we receive a mortality from, from uh, Jesus as a gift. So I came to the conclusion that immortality is conditional, conditioned upon faith in Jesus, that we don't have it in, inherently. Uh, and then I came to the conclusion that uh, propitiation to me, now it's, not everybody agrees with my take on this, but I believe the Bible is telling me uh, uh, that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Propitiation means that what he did on that cross, that suffering death on the cross paid for all the sin. And not just for mine as a believer and yours, Jack Smack and Renee's, but everybody for the sins of the whole world. Now it's not going to benefit people in terms of getting the gift of eternal life unless they believe but I believe that everybody's sins are already paid for. Everybody's. And uh, some people will say, well, they're not really forgiven unless they believe. That may be the case. Maybe I'm wrong. But I believe that everybody's already forgiven. So nobody has to pay for their sins because Jesus paid for everybody's sins. So wh what happens after they die? Well, they're, if they're lost, they're waiting, consciously aware that they're waiting for a resurrection and a judgment. So they're probably feeling tormented just because they know what's coming, not because God's torturing them, but just because of the anxiety of waiting and waiting and waiting for that judgment that's coming. And then when they are resurrected and they go before God, God shows them their life and says, look, look how many sins in your life, all the bad thoughts and deeds you did all of your failures to do good things. Uh, but guess what? All those sins, Jesus paid for them all. Your sins are paid for. But you received, you refused to receive immortality. You rejected the gift of eternal life Jesus offered to you. And it shows you like in a, a playback of your life, all the times that people tried to tell you about the free gift of salvation and you rejected it. And the more that they sin, the more they realize that more guilty they feel over the fact that, oh, God, I was forgiven so much, but I wouldn't receive the gift of eternal life. I think that's the degree of punishment that the same people who sinned even more, even feel more about, more badly about, about, oh, 
I was forgiven so much. I was so bad and he paid for my sins. I didn't, wouldn't accept Jesus and believe, receive the gift. So because they didn't receive the gift of eternal life, they don't have immortality and they die at the judgment and they're put into the lake of fire and they suffer the second death and they are cremated and they perish and no longer exist. Destruction of both body and soul. That's what I think. By looking at all the verses and putting all the pieces together in the puzzle, that's my summary of how I think it plays out. Now, Renee and many others, they think that, well, they are going to perish, uh, be destroyed, as I said in the end, and no longer exist, but they will be punished uh, based upon how, to varying degrees. Some will be punished more severely. But I disagree. I think that punishment was paid by Jesus for everybody. No one has to pay for sin, but they don't get eternal life in heaven unless they receive the gift through faith in Jesus. That's my summary of how I see it when I look at all the scriptures. Uh, let me ask uh, Renee, why don't you go next and present your how you see it, and then we'll have Jack Smack go. Yeah, um, it took a long time, and on my channel, I haven't even uploaded a video on my uh, understanding of it. Because it doesn't matter to me if somebody believes in eternal torment or that they're tormented and then thrown in the lake of fire and it eventually are destroyed. Because the judgment, I believe, the worm dieth not. They are never resurrected. They die. They miss out on eternal life. Uh, I believe that man is not immortal. Why? Because the Bible says we're not. That only God is immortal. And you'd have to be immortal to be eternally consciously tormented in hell. You would have to be an eternal being. Uh, I don't know what happens to the angels, but I'm not an angel, so I don't really care. Bible says we're we're going to judge angels one day, but I I mean they're eternal beings, so I mean God can do whatever He wants, you know. Uh, I just I like to look at Scripture, and if Scripture says something, kind of blows my mind. I go, hey, this is we need to look at this and consider this. But what I did like is we allowed Scripture to interpret itself. You know, you don't just apply your private interpretation of a verse because then you get crazy doctrine, you know, and you got to know when the Bible's using idioms and metaphors and artistic language or colorful language. And to be able, if you don't understand it or there's symbolism that you go to the Bible, because I guarantee there's one more, at least one instance where it's used somewhere else. <clears throat> and you can uh, get the context and understanding of that one so that the Bible can interpret itself. Uh Again, this is just my apologia. This is just my reasons for why I came to this conclusion. And once I really studied, then I've been considering this for over a year because I started doing a study just to have better understanding, not to see if a, to see if eternal torment was true. I assumed it was when I started this journey. I just did a subject study of all the verses on death, on hell, on afterlife, everything, every verse that, uh, you know, referenced it so that I could understand where people go and what it is. And then it turned out I started to see in scripture that this this whole the first thing I realized is there's no demons in hell torturing people, that it was created for the devil and his angels and that that is a pagan concept like Dante's Inferno and Catholic stuff. That's not even legitimate. Satan's not in hell ruling it. He's up and down the earth and he's the prince of the power of the air. But the, the whole point of the study was not to deny eternal torment. I assumed it was true, but it was to have deeper understanding. And I started leaning toward this. Then I started looking into it because I, I was like, wait a minute. It looks like they perish. They're destroyed. They suffer. And so I found maybe two or three verses that could imply eternal torment. And those are the ones I looked at and found out they're metaphoric, they're colorful. And then once I found out man's not immortal, I just completely went away. I just did away with eternal torment because it, you got to be immortal to be tormented for all of eternity. And we're not. So um, either way, the Jesus died for us. We don't have to agree on this issue at all. And you don't have to hate people or get resentful or call them names just because they disagree with you. Uh, if you trust the right Jesus and have the right gospel, 
you're my brother and sister in Christ, period. And we need to be showing a little bit more grace and liberty to people on these things. But that's how I came to the conclusion. I do believe the lost go to a place, but eventually that itself is going to be destroyed in the lake of fire. As far as the Satan and his angels, I just don't care. I, I mean, that's up to God, you know, what happens to them. Okay. All right. Thank you. Very interesting. And, uh, uh, so Jack Smack is still on the fence a little bit. Uh, we're going to find out. Well, Jack Smack, how would you describe your viewpoint on this subject uh, right now? I'm not on the fence. I, I've changed my mind on this before over the last 10 years, and I've come right back to the, you know, my original conclusion. Um, I mean, you have to look at it like human beings are completely evil, and once they leave this flesh, they're as evil as they can possibly be. There's no good in them, and it's like trying to have pity on something that's evil, like it's demonically evil. And I believe that, I mean, as long as you're still alive, there's a little tiny shred of humanity inside of everybody. Even if you're a reprobate, I mean, you're still alive, still breathing oxygen and stuff. But I mean, once you leave this, this flesh, if you are lost, you are not born again. You have no no life in you, none. I mean, so I mean, it's like the eternal punishment makes sense. But it like I said earlier, I believe the people would never want to get out. They would never want to stop, you know, cursing God and hating God and being punished by him. They would never want to leave, leave that state. So, I mean, I'm basing this on, you know, just reading the, the, these different articles, they, uh, you know, by people that supported annihilationism and conditional immortality and stuff, and they studied the Greek and were trying to say what she was saying about Aeonis and, you know, Aeon, you know, Aeonis would be like the eternity, you know, Greek word for eternity. And, I mean, I've come to the conclusion that a lot of times it says eternal for life and eternal for damnation, it's the same word in the Greek. But, I mean... I've had friends over the years that they, they despised the idea of eternal torment. They hated it. They were soul winners, but whenever they, they stopped believing in it, they stopped, they stopped soul winning too. And I'm not saying that that's the case of everybody, and that has nothing to do with this argument whatsoever. That's just a personal experience I went through. And I remember one person I told that I, you know, I just told him I got some people saved, and he was like, big deal. He told me, big deal. They're not going to be in hell forever anyway. And it just, you know, his attitude was like a turnoff. So, like I said, I mean, either way, no matter what you hold on this, your view remains view of mine. Hell's still not not a good place. It's not an ideal place to go. Whether you just get burned up completely in you know, one fell swoop, or whether you burn after a few years of, of some type of a purgation or purgatory, or whether you go there forever, it's still a terrible thing no matter what. And that's why we're called to tell people how to be saved, come what may. It doesn't matter if it's eternal, it doesn't matter if it's temporary, it doesn't matter if it's an immediate annihilation. It's still something we're supposed to warn people about. And that's the bottom line. And I just think as long as we're, we're winning souls and preaching the gospel, the the, um, the the existence of hell and how bad it is is immaterial. <laughs> okay, very interesting. Um, I, I've had some people react to my uh, view, my conclusion on this, that there is no, God doesn't torture anybody. And they, but he does destroy them. There is capital punishment. There is death, but he doesn't torture people. I've had people very upset because it seems to me that they, they just love the idea of the lost people being tortured forever and ever, but, and they're offended. I've had people offended by me saying God won't torture people forever, and that offends them. But I, I'm here to tell you that when people say that God is going to torture people forever, I find that offensive. I tolerate it. If, if someone's a brother or sister and that's what they believe and teach, I can tolerate it. I mean, because you're you're a, a believer and you're saved and I love you, but but it, it makes me sick to my stomach. It hurts me, and I believe it hurts God to be portrayed in that way to portray Jesus as someone who would either personally or, or condone and put into a system of torture forever is, is uh, in, I think it's offensive, insulting to Jesus. And I, I, I'm just, I'm just offended uh, by eternal torment as I am by the Calvinist view that God um, creates some people to just be, go to hell and they can't possibly be saved because he won't let them. They don't have free will. He creates people for that purpose and other people he creates to be saved. And, and uh, we don't have anything to say about it. To me, that doctrine is evil. It makes God 
really the only being that's evil because God controls everybody uh, and every thought, word, and deed is controlled by God. So all evil things that are done, God's making us do it like a puppet. So that means that man is an innocent puppet and God is an evil, sadistic puppeteer for us. That Calvinism I find very insulting to God. And I feel the same thing about the idea of the eternal torment, that God, let's say Jesus, Jesus is our great savior, God. I can't imagine Jesus torturing anybody for one minute. So I'm offended by it, but I'm not gonna say, hey, you can't have fellowship with me. I don't love you because of it. But unfortunately, there are people who will not give me the same grace in return that they say, no, no if you don't believe in eternal torment, you're a, a heretic. Well, I say that back at them, but I still say, uh, I, I can still have fellowship with someone who, who, who believes that. Here's the thing, Jack Smack, you've, you've been my longest friend on YouTube. I've known you for about the 10 years I've been on here. And, and uh, you know, it's been no secret. We've, we haven't agreed on this and some, a few other things over the years probably, but, but we, we've never had any issues or broken fellowship because you believe that if we agree Jesus is eternal God Almighty and that salvation is not earned by religious works, but received as a free gift, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ, in the person and finished work of Christ, and that you can't lose your salvation for any reason, eternal security. We agree on that, we unite around that, and we give each other liberty on other things. And that's the attitude that I hope that everybody can embrace. And uh, so let's see, we've, uh, basically what we've done tonight is we've covered in uh, less than three hours, what's taken me about nine hours to get through in the past on this subject with other other groups. I've done this, this is the third time I've done this. And I'm gonna use this one video tonight to replace a, a whole series that, uh, that I have done earlier, because I think tonight was a better presentation than the others, so I'll just replace it with this. But we went through it very quickly. It was very streamlined, a lot of scripture. and But I think if anybody gets nothing else out of this, I hope you understand that we don't have to agree on this, but we must agree on the three core doctrines. Uh, Renee, what is your final thoughts on this then? Yeah, the main thing is, uh, do we have the same Jesus and the same gospel? Because if we are, we're in the same body. I, I find it really upsetting that I'm not, I'm not even comfortable sharing things that I've learned or possible new ideas about scripture because of I've had death threats. I mean, literal death threats. I have stalkers, people making things about me, doing twisting things I say, and it's just really ugly, you know. And I already, I already deal with physical disability. I, I, it, it's hard. So I just try to not, if I'm going to go down being hated, it's going to be for the gospel of Jesus, you know. And so nobody has to agree with me on it. I just like to explain why I came to the conclusion, why I came to the conclusion. And that doesn't mean that I'm right. Like, I'm not comfortable enough to say I am 100% sure that I'm right on this. Because I don't, I don't. And I don't think anybody can say that until they've been there. I, I don't think scripture supports it because it says we're not immortal and that uh, death is swallowed up and death is destroyed and we perish, we suffer destruction and eternal punishment. And then we've already explained the smoke rising up forever is an idiom for uh, ultimate destruction. So uh, that's why. I don't think it's unreasonable that I came to that conclusion or you did either. And I don't think it's unreasonable that Jack Smack came up with his. I really wish that we could, as one body, just, you know, allow each other some growth space and to maybe not agree on every single thing without being called names. I mean, none of us should be able, we should be able to come together like this. And even though we don't all agree, you don't even agree with me on everything about this, you know, uh, Luke, but nobody's getting mad about it. Um, I just came to this conclusion. I, I That really made me sad when Jack Smack said his friend was like, so what? Because the Bible says save some from the fire through fear and then save others by God's goodness, right? Because it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. 
So uh, we're not saying that it won't be a terrible torment. We're just saying that it does eventually have an end to it. That's all. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's going to be terrible. I can't imagine standing before Jesus, having the most wonderful God Almighty say, I never knew you, depart from me, and then throw me into fire for, for whatever reason. That's horrific. And that's a really horrible attitude that the guy was like, so what? Do they even realize that what God has done for us, what Jesus suffered for us, what he wanted to give us as his family? That's a huge loss. Mm -hmm. The loss we have is like worse than anything to not be with Jesus. That's a huge deal. So that made me really sad. But I'm like you, Luke. I think that the torment doctrine uh, as we have proven, it came from Catholics or, or paganism infiltrating in the third and fourth century, uh, the immortal soul thing from Plato. But I think it actually keeps people from coming to God, just like the law keeps people from coming to God because people tell them they got to stop this sin or stop that to be saved. So they just never even try. They just run from God and get mad that he's going to judge them for not doing it. Um, so I, I think this actually maligns God's character more than more than uh, destruction does. Yeah, so that's where I am on. Right. Uh, let me uh, let me. I noticed in the chat room, adopted son of heaven, brother Chase. He made a comment probably an hour ago. I noticed, and you said that you love Jack Smack and you want to donate to his ministry, and I think that's a great idea. Sister Renee brought up the idea uh, earlier today, today about that, that Brother Jack Smack, we, we hate the idea that you uh, you don't have a, a, a computer that's that's good enough to even do a, a, a join the live stream. We have to talk to you via the telephone because your computer doesn't work and your cell phone is not is what it should be. So uh, I say, Brother Adopted Son, if you're serious uh, about donating and anybody else, uh, Jack Smack, tell, to just tell everybody your email address. So if anybody does want to, they can contact you and make arrangements. So what, what is your email address, brother? Um, it's Matt G. Corral at email. Uh, email. Okay, Matt. That's yeah, Yahoo.com. Yeah, Yahoo.com. Okay. Okay. okay, let me tell me if I'm getting this right for everybody. It's Matt G. Corral. That's M A T T G. C O R R E L L at, at Yahoo at Yahoo.com. So yep. that, that's Brother Jack Smack's email. Uh, if uh, Chase or anybody else uh, does seriously want to to uh, donate to Brother Jack Smack, uh, I, you know, I think that's a great idea. And I'd love to have him see him get a computer. This donate this computer I got, I'm using, I've been using the last few years, it was donated to me by one of the brethren because my computer was failing and he recognized that and he contacted me and said, I've got an extra computer I'll send you. So it's a wonderful idea. That's, and uh, uh, so that's it. That's it for the study. Uh, Brother Jack Smack, what's your, your, your last, uh, last thoughts on this? Last thoughts on this whole issue? Yeah, the, the, just the, the discussion tonight. Any last words before we say goodnight? Well, here's the thing. Anyone who is saved is not going to they would ever go to hell. So how are we ever going to know what it's like or, or how long it's going to be? Bottom line is, if you're saved, you'll never perish. So, so we need to be focused on getting people saved so that they won't they won't see it either. I mean, who, who wants to find out what hell's like through somebody else's secondhand experience because they actually went there? So that's why we need to preach the gospel um, all the time, you know, regardless of what we believe on hell, because those who are saved will never go there. I give us an eternal life and they shall never perish. So whether it's eternal or not, we're never going to perish if we're saved. So mm -hmm. I am. Yeah. Okay. Amen. Amen. Uh, uh, you've heard me say this, everybody. Uh, oh, I've said it many times. I may uh, repeat it too often, but my philosophy is that uh, uh, I'm, I'm willing to listen to different points of view on everything because I, I realize that uh, I'm, I'm not omniscient. I'm not infallible. 
I could be wrong about things. I know I've been wrong about some things in the past and people have showed me my errors and I've made my, my changes and uh, I'm willing to listen. And I hope everybody will adopt that attitude that let's listen to another point of view and let's be fair and considerate. There is a possibility your position might be wrong. And yeah, I want to say something because a viewer is saying people don't come here for doctrine. You know what? We're here discussing ideas. Who said that? So I could just. Well, I don't know. I'll tell you later. We, uh, I tell you this is a place where we discuss ideas. Everybody can, if you're part of the body of Christ, and if you're not, we want you saved, and we'll discuss that too. We'll get, we'll make sure you know the gospel. But if you're saved, it's good because iron sharpens iron. Nobody here is saying we're 100 percent right, and you better believe this. Yeah. No, I'm going to doctrine we're discussing scripture tomorrow, no one's blindly tomorrow. follow us we're not religious leaders we're just brothers and sisters discussing our ideas on things tomorrow i'm going to scroll through the uh chat room look at all the comments and and uh if we do have any troublemakers here then i'll make sure that they're blocked and i, I if a person disagrees that's fine as long as you're polite but if you start making accusations and and uh, calling people names, and 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 uh, then uh, I, I don't want you part of. You're not in the fellowship. I I'll, I'll get rid of you. Uh, but my point I'm making is that I've been willing to listen to other points of view, and because of that, I've learned some mistakes and corrected them. And my conclusion is that the truth must trump popularity. If if I come to a conclusion on any doctrine, I have to stick with what I believe is true, regardless of whether it's going to be the popular viewpoint or not. Otherwise, I would be a dishonest hypocrite. All right, Brother Jack Smack, it's always great to have you with us. I hope it can happen more often. And uh, Sister Renee, thanks again. And uh, to the viewers and uh, the chat room, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.